Hey guys, how are you? I hope and pray that all is well. Wait a minute, well, I'm up my hands again. Today we are going to be discussing, I don't want to say it's a controversial topic, um, but it's something that we need to discuss. We'll just say that. I want to talk about sexually transmitted demons. Sexually transmitted demons, because guess what? They are a real thing, and a lot of people lack education. God says my people perish for lack of knowledge. So my objective here is to make sure that you are educated. I believe that whenever you're educated about a thing, I believe that whenever you have knowledge, whenever you have wisdom, whenever you have understanding, I believe you're more likely to sustain your deliverance, to sustain your freedom, to sustain your um, your body, right? To, to present your body truly as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. It's, it becomes a lot easier when you have information. One of the things I've talked about in times past is um, how a lot of our parents made the mistake of telling us things like, don't do this because I said so. So what they did was they gave us knowledge. They gave us, okay, we know that we're not supposed to do that, but they didn't give us understanding. And knowledge without understanding is going to always puff you up because you become prideful. Knowledge without understanding will typically set the stage for rebellion. So we have to have understanding. Uh, for the most part, if, if, if daddy says or if mommy says, hey, you shouldn't be doing that, you're not married, or that, that boy don't want nothing but one thing from you, then we need understanding. And tip, sometimes uh, understanding can come in the form of giving your testimony to a person, um, you know, sharing your testimony with your children, giving them, of course, the Bible, reading Bible stories to them, giving the person examples and giving the person scriptures, giving the person revelation and, that, and all that. All right, I'm just letting you guys come on in here. And before we get started, I'm just going to just kind of give you a little bit of small talk. Um, I can tell, and this is just small talk as you guys are coming into the room. I can tell that my dog is full. I just gave him a T-R-E-A-T. He's still eating on it. Well, he, he finished it. I just, I can tell that he, 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 you can tell he is a single dog. I've been thinking about getting a second dog um, just to keep him company, but I, for whatever reason, don't think he would want the dog. Uh, for whatever reason, I think he would do like he does with other people's dogs and their kids. And that is he'll play with the dog, have fun with the dog. And then after a certain hour <laughs> or what have you, he's going to give me that look like, please send these kids home or please send this dog home or what have you. But I was handing him a treat. And when I was handing it to him, he took his time and sniffed it. And I said, you can tell you're an only dog. You can tell you're an only dog because if I had a second dog, there's usually that competition there. But that's neither here nor there. Just giving a little bit of small talk as you guys come into the room. Do me a favor. Be sure to like. Be sure to share. Put some comments in the comment section. If you're not following this channel, take the time out to follow this channel. Again, tonight we're going to be dealing with a topic that we're calling sexually transmitted demons. Um, one of the things I realized that I need to do is make sure I pull up some of these scriptures that I already got up here, Lord. Thought I already had them pulled up. How was you guys' day? Did you go to church today? Let me know that. Why in the comment section? Did you go to church? And if you say I don't have a church home, my question then becomes, what are you doing about it? Anytime somebody says I don't have this, my question is, what are you doing about it? What are you doing about it? Are you just kind of sitting around and saying what you don't have? Then that just means you don't want to have it. Or are you getting up and you doing something about it? Don't say, hey, I'm churching from home. Then that means you're self-centered. Um, and what that mean? What I mean by that is. You're in this space where you th you still think church is about you. You, you it, it, it's still a work at this time, right? It's still a work, or what have you. It's still a work at this time. Once the once it ceases to become a work, once you get into the space in your heart where you start realizing that I'm not just going to take, but I'm going to give. Even if I if nothing I give is nothing. If, if all I give is a hug, there's somebody out there that needed that hug from me. And so my my objective is to mature you to get you to a space where you start seeing things from a different perspective. And we're going to start our scripture reading off. I'm trying to let um, you had to work. OK, OK. But I, I completely understand. Um, trying to go ahead and get this prepared, but I'm trying to let a certain number of people come in. Typically, I get started at 100, but I know that we could do better than that. I know that if we're liking, if we're sharing, we're engaging. I know that it's going to come up in other people's algorithms that need it or what have you. And before before long, we'll be 150 strong up in here. We're almost there. So we're going to get started at 150 but if you don't have a church home please get up and go get you a church home please go and just pray and ask god what church you want you to go to um you want to make sure that you have wise counsel the bible says there's safety and a multitude of counselors um and at the same time for those of you you know you work on sundays and stuff like that you know see if you can talk to your managers 
about changing your schedule. If not, please don't don't permanently commit to that job. You don't want to uh, forsake the coming together of the saints. But let's go ahead and get started. I think we, we got we're 10 short, but we're going to go ahead and get started. I wanted to start off with 150 in the room, but we're going to go ahead and get started because we have about 140 in the room. So we're going to start with Ezekiel 27, 12, and we're going to read all the way to 25. And uh, right now, what I'm going to be dealing with is this thing called trade, because one of the things I want you to come to understand is the nature of trade. I want you to understand the nature of trade. Oh, what I'm about to share with you as it relates to demonology or what have you, it's going to probably be, it's going to likely blow your mind. It's going to help you to get a better understanding. God says, be wise as a serpent. Um, one of the problems that we have as a people, one of the problems that we have a, a, as believers is that we know scripture, but we don't know the word. And you may say, well, Tiffany, isn't the scripture and the word the same? Yes. But you know, when I say you don't know the word, I'm talking about relationship. A lot of people don't have relationship with the word. And if you don't have relationship with the word, then you reduce him down to nothing but words on a page. You catch that? So there's a difference with memorizing scripture right, than knowing or having intimacy with the word. There's a difference in somebody saying, oh, yeah, that's Tiffany. But that person has no knowledge of me, no comprehension of me, don't know my skills, don't know my uh, my, my characteristics, my, my, my character, the person doesn't know me intimately, but they just know my name. That's a, there's a difference in that. And I want you to understand there's a lot of believers, a lot of you right now, you have knowledge, but no understanding you have knowledge, but no wisdom. The Bible says that wisdom is the principal thing. And so having a relationship with the word is mean, is when you take it in your heart so that you don't sin against God, when you take it in and you seek to understand it, it's why the Bible says to not and the door should be open, but it's when you seek to understand, it's when you want to understand. But if you're religious, you only store it in your head, not in your heart. You store it in your head so you can be right instead of being righteous. If you're religious, you store it in your head so that you can say, well, God, listen, you said this in your word, so you can parakeet and say to God what he said, but at the same time, God is looking at your heart. Man looks at the outward appearance according to the word of God, but God looks at your heart. And this is where God will look at some people and say, hey, get away from me because I don't know you. It's because the word is not in their heart, it's in their head. It's not in their heart, it's in their head. So let's go ahead and get started. We're going to start with Ezekiel 27, 12. This is going to be a little bit of, of reading, but it's Ezekiel 27, 12 through 25. Tarshish, Tarshish was thy merchant by reason of the multitude of thy riches with silver, iron, tin, and lead. They traded in thy fairs. Javon, Tabal, and Meshach, they were thy merchants. They traded the persons of men and vessels of brass in, the, in thy market. They of the house of Tograma traded in thy fairs with horses and horsemen and mules. The men of Dedan were thy merchants. Where was I? Many owls were the merchants of thy hand. They bought thee for a present horns of ivory and ebony. Syria was thy merchant. By reason of the multitude of the wares of thy making, they occupied in thy fairs with emeralds, purple, embroidered work, and fine linen, and coral, and agate. Judah and the land of Israel, they were thy merchants, and they traded in thy market wheat of minnet, and panag, and honey, and oil, and balm. Damascus was thy merchant, and the multitude of the wares of thy making, for the multitude of all riches, the wine of Helbun, and white wool. Then also in Javan, going to and fro, occupied in thy fairs, bright iron, Cassia, and Calamus were thy were in thy market. The Don was thy merchant, and precious clothes and for chariots. We're almost done, guys. Arabia and all princes of Kedar, they occupied with thee in lambs and rams and goats. In these were thy merchants. The merchants of Sheba and Ramah, they were thy merchants. They occupied in thy fairs with the chief of all spices. And with all precious stones and gold, Haran and Cana and Eden, the merchants of Sheba, Ashur, and Shumat were thy merchants. These were thy merchants in all sorts of things, in blue clothes, embroidered work, and in chests of rich apparel bound with cords and made of cedar among thy merchandise. Again, in this, Mahalia, thank you, God bless you, beautiful lady. In this, the objective is to get you to understand the nature of trade. Because if I can get you to understand trade, if you understand trade in the biblical days or just really get an understanding of the nature of trade, then it, you're going to have a greater understanding as it relates to what I'm about to teach you when it comes down to sexually transmitted demons or what have you. So I know and that Ezekiel, that's Ezekiel 27, 12 through 25. Now we'll move on to and this one's going to be short Ezekiel 28, 
16 through 18. And this is where the Lord is addressing uh, Satan. He's addressing him um, when Satan had fallen. Well, right. Let me see where I am. 16. Let me show. Sure I, I hope I got it right. Oh, 28. I gotta, I'm, I'm wondering why. Why does this not line? 28 through 16. Y'all forgive us forgive me. All right. And we'll start at 15. We'll start at 15 and we'll stop at 18. We'll start at 15 and it's longer, but we'll stop at 18. Okay. By the multitude. No, that was perfect in thy ways. Again, this is God addressing Lucifer. That was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitudes of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings, that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Now, the traffic is talking about trading. Therefore, will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour, devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. So we see trade going on. I'm going to explain that as we get a little bit uh, further up in here because it's one of my notes and I don't want to jump ahead. Um, but I'll just keep that in your mind. Uh, we talked about Lucifer, his fall, and how God addressed him. So keep that in mind. That was, again, Ezekiel 28, 16 through 18. Ezekiel 28, 16 through 18. I can just kind of go ahead, go ahead and kind of step on that. And then once we get to it in the notes, um, what are the things that Satan does? And this is a part of the notes. So by the time I get to that, we'll probably just brush past that. But one of the things that the enemy did with God's angels, you know, that whenever Lucifer fell, he took one third of God's angels with him. But Lucifer was a covering sheriff. And I need you to understand rank as it relates to the Bible. There's always rank and there's always king order in the kingdom of God. Wherever there's no rank, wherever there's no order, there's going to be corrosion. corrosion. Uh, there's going to be perversion, corrosion, and chaos, right? Whenever there's no rank, you're not going to find God. Wherever there's no order, you're not going to find God. Everything that God does, he does, he does it in order. And so what the enemy did, the enemy had an imagination. He had an ungodly thought meaning a thought outside of God. He had a thought that was contrary to God. He had an imagination that he did not address. And in his imagination, he started imagining himself being like God. Um, and so consequently, he devises this scheme in order to split the kingdom of God. He devises this theme. And I don't think his ob objective, um, I won't say his objective was to split. It could have been to split, but the objective was really to take control. If you see that in nature of kings, in the Bible is that even when a nation is split, if a, if a king or somebody comes up and they successfully split a nation, they're still going to keep going after that nation until they take over. So it's the, the start typically of a takeover, takeover. But Lucifer traded. But with who? Angels, the angels of God, one third of God's angels. So what Lucifer did again, we're talking about rank. Because Lucifer had a great measure of rank with rank that you have more access to intimate information in every industry, wherever there is rank. If there is a boss, the boss has more access to information and systems than the people out that, you know, than the people that's working for the company. The the person over the boss, the manager or, or the, the the what do you call that? The regional manager or what have you is going to have more revelation and more insight, more information than the boss himself. And the more you go up every person, every person in rank, you're going to find that they have more information. Same is true when it comes down to the military. Every time you see more rank, there's going to be more information. So that is to say that even in the kingdom of God, where they're being ranked, there are some angels that have or more privy to revelation and mysteries of God than others. And so the ones that God gives certain rank to, they have more information. So what did Lucifer trade? Information. And of course, he's the father of a lie as well. So what he did was he twisted what he gave. He gave them some truth and he gave them some lies as well. And so basically he did that in exchange for their loyalties. That's already in my notes. We're going to address that later on. But he did that in exchange. And this is where God is talking about um, him trafficking. Basically, it's a form of prostitution, right? And this is a form of prostitution. And so within this, what Lucifer did is he said, okay, listen, 
you y'all know I'm in the back room. Y'all know I get to go into the presence of God. Y'all know that I got access to the mysteries of God. There's some stuff going on that y'all don't know about. Y'all don't know that God is planning to bring forth humans. Y'all don't know this. Y'all don't know that. And this is what's going to happen. And so listen, if you really want to make sure that you're good, this is what and he started introducing them to lies or what have you. And consequently, one third of God's angels fail. One third of God's angels fail to this day. God, uh, to this day, Satan still traffics. To this day, Satan is still tempting you. To this day, Satan still comes up to you and he'll say, hey, I'll give you a husband in exchange for your body. I'll give you an, a wife in exchange for your body. Right. I'll give you this. I'll give you that. It's still trafficking. And another word for trafficking is prostitution. See, we, 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 we look at a person that is intentionally selling her body and she calls herself a, a street walker, a prostitute, whatever she wants. And we look at that person and we look down, but it is a reflection of what we have a tendency to do. What you see the world doing is a reflection of what we do as believers, what we've legalized in the earth realm. Everything taking place in the realm of the earth right now has been legalized by believers. Everything taking place in the earth right now has been legalized by believers. Um, whatever you allow on earth is allowed in heaven. Whatever you bind or disallow on earth is disallowed in heaven. So I want to just go ahead and start jumping into some notes, what have you. And um, we'll see where we go from there. So I got three things I want to, uh, three notes I want to give before we get into some few, a few facts. Number one, if you are aware of the, the parable of talent, you should be where uh, the master gives one servant, one talent, he gives another one three talents and he gives another one. Well, he gives one talent, the other one has two and the other one has five talents. The one who had five talents went and multiplied um, his talents. The one who had two went and multiplied his talents. The one who had one went and buried his talent. When the master came back, he rebuked the one uh, that the one who had one talent who had buried his talent in the ground. He took that talent from him and gave it to the one who had five, the one who had doubled his talents. He took it from him and gave it to the one who had five. And then he cast the unfaithful servant into outer darkness. So, Number one, on this particular list, I want to read uh, this. This has everything to do with that. The master gave his servants talents and he expected them to grow and multiply the talents he's given them. He expected them to grow and to multiply. Again, this is dealing with trade. That's a really good question. A lot of people think that, you know, they ask the question, who put that thought in Lucifer? Was there some other evil entity? No, we had the, the mechanism of will. And so in that, he just had a thought. So I don't want you to think when you go to heaven, that your brain is controlled. God gave us free will because he wants us to choose to love him. And so all the angels have the access, they have access to the freedom of will. They have access to will to make a decision. Um, This is why God, when he put Adam and Eve in the garden of Eden, he told them what they could not eat. He said, don't eat from this tree, but Eve still did it. So which means that she wasn't under control. She wasn't possessed. Um, She had to, I mean, she was owned by God, but she had the freedom of will. Oh, what have you? So the thought that came within Lucifer came, came from Lucifer himself. So th there is the ability to have an, an evil thought and to act upon that thought. There is a the ability to have a not so good thought um, and to act upon the thought or what have you. So it's not necessarily one of those things, because I think now we think that all of our evil thoughts come from the devil. And that's not true. A lot of the evil thoughts that you have come from your heart. And it can come from you going out there, for example, and seeing something, see somebody's husband and want him. Right. And say she got a really good husband. Oh, and he good looking, too. And he take care of her. He love her. And you can look at that person and you can have that thought. Now, if you have that thought, you have to address your heart. You have to say, OK, something is wrong. And um, you, you, you bind it up and you cast it down or what have you. Um, or you cast it down. You don't have to bind it, but you cast it down. For the most part, the Bible says casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So you're supposed to address it there. But when you don't address it and you meditate on it, then it will plant a seed and it will start to grow fruit. And the next thing you know, something will start to bud, with, bud within your heart. So let's move on. The master gave his servants talents and he expected them to grow and multiply the talents he'd given them. This is trade. The master, he sits back and he says, here, I'm going to give you this talent. I'm going to hand you this talent. Your objective, your assignment is to go and to multiply that talent and then again to give it back to the master. And then he doubles you, he triples you. If you're faithful over little, he makes you ruler over much. So he's benefiting and you're benefiting. He's benefiting by bring, you're bringing souls into the kingdom of God. He's benefiting because it's offensive to God when he can't bless you.
It's offensive to God when he cannot prosper you. It's offensive to God when you have no understanding of God. You say, oh, God can do everything. God gave us dominion over the earth. He can do all things but lie, but God doesn't go against his, go against what he's giving you. He's already given you dominion, so he doesn't come and interrupt that dominion and take authority. He, you can submit to him, and that way he has dominion over you and dominion over everything that you have dominion over, but God does not possess your will. He's giving you dominion in the earth, and your assignment then is to take what he's giving you and to multiply it, to multiply it. Number two. There is a story of the fig tree. You guys know that Jesus cursed the fig tree and it dried up. Um, so number two, God gave life to the fig tree and expected it to bear fruit. What am I trying to say to you? Everything God gives you, he expects you to multiply. When Jesus came and he saw that fig tree and the Bible says he was hungry, he hungered. And he went to that fig tree. Jesus came looking for fruit, but there were no fruit on that fig tree. So he cursed the fig tree and it dried up. And so God gave life to the fig tree and he expected it to bear fruit. God gave you life. He expects you to bear fruit. The fruit that you do not want to go before God with, the only thing you ever accomplished in this life is 14 bodies and you finally slammed the husband and then you've been going to church for the rest of your life and that's it. Because then you didn't accomplish your assignment in the earth because you made everything while you were in the earth all about you. And I've told you guys before, in, in America and in most Western countries, we have a bit, we could be a little bit narcissistic as it relates to Christianity because we think Christianity is about houses, cars, and husbands and wives and all of the stuff that we want. And, you know, rarely do we have people that grow up and mature and heal enough to understand, you know, the basis of Christianity, which is love. It's about winning souls uh, to Christ Jesus, right? God gave life and giving glory to God. No, no, let me neglect to say that, but God gave life to the fig tree and he expected it to bear fruit. Number three, God gave us fivefold gifts. And there's a scripture that tells us that he gave us the apostle, the prophet, the pastor, the teacher, and the evangelist. He gave us fivefold gifts and he expects us to utilize them for wisdom and direction. This is where, you know, the, the whole concept of, you know, all pastors being bad and all that, that's, that's, not, that's not true. That's illegal. God gave us a gift and it is a sin and a shame to reject a gift that God has given you. Have you ever had somebody to give you a gift and then you turn around and reject that gift? That's ungodly. I'll tell you this. I can tell you one time I was disrespectful. I was young and I was in the world and we had that secret. It wasn't a secret Santa. Uh, I was working at Walmart and we had to trade. So I had, to, you know, you pull somebody's name and you would, you know, you buy that person a gift and they bought you a gift or what have you. Well, and you you knew who you knew. No, I take that back. It was Secret Santa. It was Secret Santa. The person pulled your name. They you didn't know who had your name, but you you only knew the name you had. So I pulled this girl's name, and I remember our budget was like ten dollars. And I pulled this girl's name and I went and got her like a $15 sweater. Beautiful sweater. I'm talking about this sweater was so pretty, and I knew she loved it. I knew her a little bit. Didn't have too much of a personal relationship with her, but I had a workplace relationship with her. And so I was glad to have pulled her name. So, brother, thank you. God bless you. But what ends up happening is there was a woman who pulled my name. She was an older woman. And she bought me a um, she bought me a pullover vest knitted that looked like men's socks. I, I don't know how to explain it. You know how the, they had those little diamonds on men's socks and stuff? I was in my early 20s. Probably wasn't in my 20s yet. I was not happy to see that thing. And, you know, the when I look back on it, I was thinking about that the other day. When I look back on it, I regret how I reacted. I regret how I, how I reacted because I didn't make any secret that I didn't like it. Because when she gave it to me, I was like, oh, thank you. She said, you don't like it? I said, it, and she said, you don't like it. I was like, not really. I regret. I should have just been like, it's nice. It's really good. Thank you so very much. But I was so frustrated in that, you know, because I felt like I had given away $15 only to get a big sock back to wear as a vest or what have you. But that's the way God feels when you reject a gift. When God sends somebody into your life and you reject that gift of God, is God handing you something great because he knows that if you were to open that gift, you're going to get something out of it that you want. But you already know whenever you get a gift, most of the times it's wrapped up in what you don't want, right? So whenever you get a gift, you got to peel the paper back. It's going to be in a box or what have you. Sometimes it can be arduous. Sometimes it can be frustrating. Oh, what have you? Sometimes you can deal with impatience because you want to get to what's in that box. It's mysterious. You don't always know what's in the box. So when God gives you a gift, there is some things that you make you will typically go through to get to what's on the inside of that person. 
And I need the body of Christ to know that. There, sometimes you'll go through hardship. Sometimes you'll go through frustration. You got to go through your own offense because the gift will reveal you. Okay, think of it this way. The Bible refers to God as light. And of course, not light in a new age sense of the word, word God is revelation, right? Wherever God goes, there cannot be darkness. God is light. Wherever, if God forms a gift and he gives you a gift, it's in the presence of light. So that means that when God does it, there's going to be light attached to that gift, right? And so what happens is when you open it, that light, the light of God, the glory of God radiates and it's going to expose everything that's in you. It's going to expose everything that's in you. If you got jealousy, competition, comparison, envy, adultery, idolatry, witchcraft, uh, anger, rage, unforgiveness, it will be revealed in the gifts of God. Whenever a gift comes about, this is why some of y'all, you don't like going to church because what it does is it reveals what's in you. And when you don't know how to take accountability, you will find somebody in the church to blame and say, well, this is why I don't go to church is because half the folks up in there, they ain't saved. Half the folks up in there, they ain't this. No, it reveals you. When you go into the church, when you get around church folks, you're going to see even ignorant people, even broken people will reveal you, right? So if you got offense in your heart, I remember I told you guys that time I went to Target, I had just did deliverance, right? This was some years ago, but I had just did a mass deliverance, got off the phone with mass deliverance, went to the store and this lady, she's wait, I went to Target and this lady wait, was waiting out in the foyer and she just seemed to be out of it. I know now that this woman was in the full demonic manifestation. Oh, what have you? Maybe the, the light of God was still on me. This lady just comes walking out. This Asian lady walks in front of me, just cuts me off. And then she, she proceeds to move really slow, really slow. And I try to get around her and she keeps blocking me. Oh, what have you? And what it did was the light of God that was in me likely exposed her, but the darkness exposed me. It exposed that I needed some more growing up to do. It exposed because in that I started thinking like if this lady, if she keep on playing with me, if she touched me because she's getting close to the point where her, she's doing a lot of stuff. If she touched me, I'm going to drag her. I'm going to drag her. And when I got out there, that store, I had to pray and I had to repent. I said that, Lord, I don't want that. That's vengeance. That doesn't belong to me. That belongs to you. So it looks like I still got something that belongs to you. Here goes that vengeance back, God, or what have you. And looking back, in hindsight, uh, I wish I had prayed for her. You'll have many events like that. I wish I had prayed for her. I wish I had taken the time out to just kind of stop and say, are you okay? I, I wish I wish I had done that. But, you know, we, lo- we live and we learn. We live and we learn. But God gave us fivefold gifts. He gave you the pastor. The pastor comes from God. Not all pastors come from God. This is where your relationship with God comes in. Your relationship with God is going to be where you have the light of God through your Bible study. For you you being uh, in the presence of God through worship and prayer, that's when the light of God comes and you're able to discern, right? Uh, you're able to discern. But when you don't have the light of God in you, when you have a codependent or a dependent personality where you want to go and depend on somebody because you don't want nobody, you want to be fed. Meaning you don't want to just go study the word for yourself. You want to be fed. And when you have that type of personality or not personality, but mentality, then a lot of times you're going to heap up leaders for yourself who are not after God's own heart. But God said, I will give you pastors after my own heart. These are gifts. So you have pastors, you have a prophet, you have prophets, apostles, teachers, and evangelists. These are gifts of God. These are gifts of God. All right, let's get into some facts. I got like 20 facts I think I want to give you guys. And then we're going to talk about how to get rid of those demons. And then we're going to get up out of here. Okay. I got about 20 facts I want to give you guys. And I'm going to try not to read. I'm going to try not to be too long with each one. Number one, the kingdom of God has an economy. The kingdom of darkness has an economy. Every kingdom and everything that's established is going to have an economy. That's important to know. Just like in a human kingdom, we have an economy. You go to different countries in the world, they have an economy. So the kingdom of, the kingdom of God has an economy. And it's not necessarily trade with money. But the kingdom of God has an economy. The kingdom of darkness has an economy. Number two, in the biblical times, the nations not only traded goods, they also traded people. And you can put in parentheses, intermarriage and slavery. They didn't just trade goods. They traded people. That's important. That's important. So, for example, um, a lot of nations, you know, whenever they wanted to create a treaty, uh, they wanted to create some type of unification between the two of them. What, what they will say is, you can marry our women and our men will marry your wives. What, what happened? So basically, we can trade and we can trade. So um, whereas 
in times past, we would have bust your head wide open for coming over here trying to talk to our women. We're opening up a, an agreement where we can operate as a unit. We can operate as a unit. So in the biblical times, the nations not only traded goods, this is important. They also traded people into marriage and slavery. You can take a slave or you can take slaves from here. You know, the slave trade back in um, where African-Americans were taken in captivity. Um, realistically speaking, a lot of our kin folks sold us into slavery, right? They sold us. They, they, they sold our ancestors uh, for the most part into slavery. So that, that's the nature of trade. Trade has always been a big thing in the earth. All right. Number three. The purpose of marketplace trade was to supply a need or a demand that one nation had. The purpose of marketplace trade was to supply a need or a demand that one nation had. So, for example, to make it practical, let's say I had a kingdom and in my kingdom. We had apples and oranges, but your kingdom because of the climate. Right. Let's just say my kingdom is Florida, <laughs> Florida. So I'm, I'm getting all these fruits growing out here and your kingdom is New York. It's cold out there, but you have certain things that grow in New York or that flourish in New York that wouldn't flourish in Florida. I got some stuff in Florida that flourishes in Florida that doesn't flourish in New York. So then we can end up having a trade agreement. Whereas I say, hey, listen, I'll let you get some of these oranges and some of these apples, watermelons and all this stuff that flourishes over in a tropical climate. And then this is what I need from you. Now, I don't think I can't think of any fruit that flourishes in cold weather. But in New York, maybe they have uh, certain types of trees um, that have a certain type of wood, uh, like acacia wood or what have you. Or it could be a skill, a talent, a strength that they have. Basically, it's just, you know, we're making an agreement because I don't have what you have and you don't have what I had. And I wish y'all understand. I wish y'all understood that as it relates to marriage, many marriages are destroyed because people don't understand understand the concept of trade. A lot of times we want to marry you. We want to have a same gift relationship, almost like a same sex relationship. We want to have a relationship with somebody that has the same gifts and the same strengths and all of that, rather than have a relationship and understand where I'm weak, this man's going to be strong and where I'm strong, he's going to be weak. And rather than me exposing his, his weakness, my, my design and my desire is to trade with him in that area. And this, this nature of trade is called impartation. And it's also to cover him in this area and to make sure that nobody can take advantage of him in that area. And it's the same is true for me. He'll come into my life and say, hey, listen, you got this issue right here. And he covers that area. It's not for him to sit up there and start a fight and say, I'm so tired of that. Or what have you? Because him being tired of that is not going to put the fruit I need in that area. Does that make sense? So when you come in contact with people, typically they're going to have when many God ordained relationships, people are they're going to come in and there's going to be something they need from you. There's going to be something they need from you. There's going to be something you need from them. And you're not going to get it. It's not going to be like trade right now. Sometimes I can be, I can give wisdom and revelation to a friend, for example. And, you know, that's in that season. But then there, there comes a time where I need something. I may need wisdom and revelation. And in an area where I'm ignorant, that friend is going to be strong. In the area where I'm ignorant, that friend is going to say, oh, no, no. So what you got to do is this. That This is where you start to create balance and what have you. But the nature of everything is trade. Every time somebody taps you on the shoulders and says, hey, listen, I want to get to know you. I want to go to lunch with you. I want to, you know, just try to basically see about building a relationship with you. They're looking for trade. Sister Nancy, thank you. God bless you, beautiful. Uh, but they're looking for trade. Anytime people sit back and say, hey, you know, let, let, let's hang out. The nature of everything in the earth is trade. Let's get back into it. All right. Number four, the purpose of trading people was to build trust. Let me see. Did I read number three? Oh, yeah. Number four, the purpose of trading people was to build trust and to unite the nations. The purpose, and we're talking about the biblical days when they when we said that, that, you know, they would trade people through intermarriage and slavery. But the purpose of trading people was to build trust, you know, so to, to build trust. Um, what was that? Number four. And to unite the nations. I had a, I had a, a one of those moments, what have you. But to build trust. So that basically, if my people over there, they can pretty much monitor you. They can spy you out. And if they become your people, then you're going to have a relationship with them. You're going to have more empathy towards them. So we ain't got to worry about you trying to sneak attack us or what have you. So it's to build trust and to unite the nations. It's to create a bigger unit of a nation as opposed to having th two small nations, three small nations. It's to come together as one big, large nation. 
whereas each nation still has his own king or what have you, but they will operate as one. This is why um, Jehoshaphat told King Ahab, you know, basically, if you go to war against King, um, if you go to war against Ramoth Gilead, my people will be as your people, right? And so that's the nature of trade. Number five, Satan, Satan likely trafficked or traded, and we talked about this, so we're going to kind of pass by this, um, but we'll stop here just for a few seconds. Satan likely tra trafficked or traded the revelation or mysteries of God with many of God's angels in exchange for their loyalty. In exchange for their loyalty. So he, that's what he was trafficking. In the book of Ezekiel 28, 16 through 18, that, that's what he was trafficking is revelation and the mysteries of God. He was trafficking. Let's say, for example, you know, whenever I was supervised, I worked at um, AT&T. When I was supervised, I had access to information, especially information, not just systems, data, and all that other stuff. I also had access to information about this girl is problematic. Um, she, she's not coming to work because her husband, she, and it wasn't gossip. It's leaders talking to leaders, trying to give us understanding as to what's going on with this person. And so with me having access to that information, I couldn't go share that information with nobody else, right? That, that was information that was between me. And if, if a leader said to me, okay, we're having problems with this particular girl. She may show up. She comes to work. She doesn't like to sit, sit at her station. She keeps getting up, going to the bathroom. She keeps doing that. The purpose of that was for me to monitor her. The purpose of that was for me to sit back and to write that down and to report back. And that way we can develop, you know, if they wanted to terminate that girl, if they wanted to write her up, we could, we could develop a book. We could develop a log of her behavior. And then we can sit back and by the time she's in the office about to be terminated, then, you know, they're reading the log on April 4th. You did this on April 17th. You did this. But if the if the other supervisor did not communicate that with me, I may think it's just an issue that's happening on my shift. And so as we're getting up, you know, we're kind of exchanging information and what have you. Number six, to access another kingdom's economy that was not willing to negotiate or to negotiate or trade or if a nation wanted to capture a, a nation altogether and its goods, the opposing nation would build a siege around the nation it wanted to plunder. I said a mouthful, I'm going to say it again, then I'm going to make it make sense. To access another kingdom's economy that was not willing to negotiate or trade, or if a nation wanted to capture a nation and its goods altogether, the opposing nation would build a siege around the nation it wanted to plunder. And so you may say, well, Sister Tiffany, what does a siege look like? Um, the reason I want to give you a picture of a siege, and I know I've talked about it on this channel before, the picture of a siege is so that you understand that demons do the same thing with your soul. The stuff that you see they, them doing back in the natural, back in the uh, biblical days, back in the old times, even today, is a reflection of what demons do. And so the purpose of a siege back then is that you had a kingdom. And I, I, I'll kind of draw it out to make it make sense. But you had a kingdom. And let's say that this little dot right here is the kingdom. This was your kingdom. This is where you ruled, right? This is where you ruled. And your kingdom was doing really good. It was a lot of plants and flowers and fruit. And uh, it's just flourishing. The economy is great. It's just flourishing. Nations nearby will hear about how you got big, giant bananas and grapes and strawberries and you know, you got uh, your cattle is thriving. You're not lacking for anything or what have you. And those na those nations will covet what you have. They will sit back and say, we want that. And then they would try to send spies out, um, what have you. So they're trying to access your kingdom. Now, there are different military tactics that they use. But one military tactic was called a siege. In a siege, what, the what they would do is after they spied out the land, and once they've decided that they can take you, once they decided that they can overcome you, what they would typically do is they would build a siege around you. That circle around you is military. They will surround you with people. They will surround you with military. They may even build walls or what have you, but they will surround you or they will surround that nation. They will surround your kingdom. The purpose of that wall was to make sure that you could no longer trade. You couldn't trade with the other nations. So now your demand, so this is what it set the stage for famine and sometimes even a drought. So you couldn't come out. So let's just say your water source was out here. This is your water source. This is your water source, but you're trapped in here. Oh, God, what the heck is that? Sorry. 
That was a big giant ant. Y'all, I'm so sorry. It happens to me on camera every time. Big, huge ant. But getting back to it, your water source. And then you had other things that you had you needed um, in order to supply your king. There were certain things that you needed for your kingdom because you've been trading with these nations or what have you. So there's some foods that you want. There are some woods that you need. There are some uh, trades. And by trades, I mean talents, some types of people that you need in order for your, your economy to grow. And so what they did was they affected all of these different areas. And so if you came out of, oh yeah, I see him, he did. But um, I was wondering where that ant went because y'all know you hit an ant, the things don't die. But the it once they surrounded you, the objective was to create a drought and a famine. That was the objective. This is what demons do to the soul, right? This is what demons do to the soul. For example, isolation. The, the demon, what demons will do is they will isolate you so you can't, get impartation from somebody else but this is what demons would do they would build you have your kingdom uh, a nation what they would do is they will build a siege around that kingdom whereas that kingdom over the course of time they, they had a little bit of water left or what have you but they slowly but surely started to lose out on their supplies they started going into a famine they start there are certain things that they were building they couldn't build anymore certain things that they were doing and slowly but surely the people would come out you know um Starting with the military, sometimes they'll try to escape and then they would be slaughtered by the people who were surrounding them and, or taken into captivity or what have you. The objective was to drive them out. It was to weaken them and to drive them out. And hear me when I tell you, demons still use that tactic to this day. They still use that ta tactic to this day. A demonic siege can look like you being surrounded by the wrong friends. It can, it can look like you trusting in family members and not growing up to heal enough to understand that um that family member is toxic is you being surrounded by the wrong people to the point where god can't bless you remember i told you it's offensive to god when he can't bless you it's offensive to god when he wants to do great and marvelous things in your life but your heart is not positioned to receive from him your heart is not positioned to receive from him so where was i okay number six to access another nation's and another kingdom's economy that was not willing to negotiate a trade or if a nation wanted to capture a nation and its goods all together, the opposing nation would build a siege. They would build a siege. So the objective, again, do me a favor, guys. Let's have a like and share break. If you haven't liked already, hit the like button and share. But they would create a siege around it. And this is what the enemy does. The enemy, some of you right now, you're dealing with a siege, right? The enemy has caused a drought in your life. He's caused a delay in your life. He's caused some things in your life. And the way he's done it is by surrounding you with the wrong people, by surrounding you with the wrong people or surrounding you, um, filling you with the wrong revelation or what have you, because there are some things a nation can have that is considered worthless. For example, we got pine cones. Pine cones, for the most part, are considered worthless. So if I was a nation of Florida and there was a nation of New York and I said to New York, hey, excuse me, we got pine cones over here. They say, can you eat them? No. Can you use them for wood? They're too weak. What can we do with them? decor they can sit back and say yeah no we good on that we good on it so the enemy wants to fill you with worthless things i wish y'all heard me because y'all looking at me right now i wish you heard me the enemy wants to fill you with worthless things worthless ideologies worthless doctrines worthless relationships he wants to fill you with worthless things because then he can keep you in that system of worthlessness worthlessness is a system Worthlessness is a system within itself. Worthlessness. And so what, what happens is you become this person that's just, there's no benefit to having you as a friend. There's no benefit to having you. In, so you become a taker. You become a consumer or what have you. And so everywhere you go, you're vacuum cleaning. You're, you're just taking, taking, taking because you are filled with worthless things. Does that make sense? You ever have people that try to come into your life and it's just like a one-sided relationship. They, they just take, 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 take. And they never, never give, 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 give. And so consequently, you get rid of them. Um, you get rid of them because you start to realize that, hey, this is not a, a, a balanced relationship. I'm trying to see what this little note I wrote down here. Oh, yeah. Bond strong man. So to access another team's economy, 
one thing that the enemy has to do is he has to bind a strong man. Now, that's a deliverance principle, but that's also a, a principle of war is that you have to bind a strong man. A strong man of a nation was a king. The strong man of a nation was a king. So that was another warfare tactic was that they were always playing chess, right? They were always trying to get to the king to take him into captivity. Captivity. Uh, the king represented a ruler. And then after they got the king, they would go out to the princes. The prince represents principalities. And so what the objective is, is if you remove the king, if you remove the princes, you can establish a new system. Is establish a new system. Number seven, let's move on. Demons create or provoke famines. This way, God's people will be too hungry to resist trading with the devil. I wish you heard that. I Y'all, when I tell you, I pray your ears are open. I pray that you're really taking this in. But demons create or provoke famines. Remember, you're talking about that siege or, you know, they can come against what, you know, they can come against you in so many different ways. But demons create or provoke famines. In our case, a famine would be poverty. Uh, this way, God's people will be too hungry to resist trading with the devil. You'll be too hungry. You got too much stuff. The less you have, the more likely you are to fall for the devil's tricks. So, for example, always give this example. If you make seven dollars an hour making that working at a gas station, you got three kids. You are already beneath the poverty line. Right. You, you're struggling. A man comes into your life. And you call yourself a Christian. You believe in God. But a man comes into your life. And he made eighteen dollars an hour and he ain't got no kids. And he seems to be, you know, really wanting you really into you. It, it would be hard for you as a believer to resist him because he's coming in where you have a need. He has supply. So we are traders by nature. And so consequently, this is why God says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. God wants to supply all of the voids you have in your life. God wants to fill those spaces. If not, what ends up happening is somebody can come in as demonized. Somebody can come in from Satan's camp. Come, somebody can come in. And they can tempt you based on your need. And you're more likely to fall for it than if you weren't hungry. So if, if I'm sitting up here, you think about Esau. When uh, his brother comes and said, when Jacob says to him, hey, listen, Esau comes and says, hey, excuse me, listen, give me some of that soup you got. I'm so hungry. And his brother trades him his birthright, right? When he's full, I'm pretty sure he's, you know, he, we know he regretted it. When he's full, he regretted it. When you're hungry, you will give up things that are valuable and invaluable, meaning there is no value affixed to them. When you're hungry, you'll give up things that are valuable and invaluable based on your hunger, right? Based on your hunger. And so what God does, he says, hey, come over here and seek me first so that I can address those hunger pains in you, those generational hungers, those generational voids, those generational appetites, that perversion, that, that loneliness, that fear, the insecurity, the rejection. Come over here. Let me go ahead and address those things. Let me go ahead and heal your heart. Let me give you a new heart, a new mind. And then I'll give you the desires of your heart. And what you're going to find is that once I fill you up, once I fix you, once I heal you, once I transform you, those appetites will go away. And you will find that from that point on, whereas at one point you were desperate for a husband or you were desperate for a wife, you'll find yourself feeling something called content. Right. And so now you're no longer contentious because you're content. So it's just like driving in a car. If you ate at home and you passed by Burger King and you smell that, you smell the hamburger, you're not tempted. You smell it, but you're not hungry because you already ate. If you go and you go into a restaurant and you say, yeah, um, this is an expensive restaurant, but my friend, she wanted to have a business meeting here. Only thing I plan on getting here is maybe a dessert because, you know, the dessert is like $30 or what have you. Let's say it's a super expensive dessert. You say, I, I'll put $30 into the dessert or what have you. But other than that, I'm only coming because this is what she wants. And you go to that restaurant. If you eat before you get there, you're good. But if you don't eat before you get there, you might end up splurging like $300 on some food. And you'll leave there and you'll be mad because you went there hungry. It's a difference. And so the enemy likes to catch you in your stage of hunger because you're more likely to trade when you're hungry. You'll give up your body when you're hungry. I mean, and I'm talking about give up your body to fornication, give up your body to drugs. You'll be willing to settle for something that's less than God's best for you when you're hungry. Whenever there's a void, whenever there's an appetite that has not been addressed, you're willing to, to make a deal with the devil. The demons create or provoke famines. This way, God's people will be too hungry to resist trading with the devil. And I got a scripture up here, Genesis 47, 16 through 22. Prayerfully, I got it open. I think I do. I think I do, Lord. Yep, I do. Genesis 47, 16 
through 22. And Joseph said, give your cattle and I will give you for you. I will, nah, I'm going to start it over. And Joseph said, give your cattle and I will give you for your cattle if money fail. And they brought their cattle unto Joseph and Joseph gave them bread in exchange for horses and for the flocks and for the cattle of the herds and for the asses. And he fed them with bread for all of their cattle for that year. Now, this is the time when he's in um, Egypt and he's working for Pharaoh. When that year was ended, they came unto him the second year and said unto him, we will not hide it from that from my Lord. How that our money is spent. My Lord also has our herds, has our herds of cattle. There is not that is not all left in the sight of thy Lord, but our bodies and our lands. Wherefore shall we die before thine eyes, both we and our land buy us and our land for bread. In other words, we selling ourselves to you Buy us and our land for bread and we. And our land will be servants unto Pharaoh. Pharaoh is a, a typology of a demo, of a principality, a demon. And give us seed that we may live and not die, that the land be not desolate. So you know that they're going through a famine at that time. And so when you're in a famine, like I said, you start giving up stuff, right? You start making deals with the devil when you're in a famine because you're hungry. When you're in a famine, and a lot of times, we, again, poverty is a form of a famine. Reve there's, there could be a revelation family, which does lead to poverty. Um, there could be so many different famines. There, there could be a relational famine. And sometimes we do that to ourselves. We isol isolate ourselves. You can create a famine in your life. And over the course of time, famines create desperation. Her, uh, hope deferred makes the heart sick. So famines create desperation. And so before long, what you end up doing is you end up making a deal with the devil. You'll end up sitting back and saying, hey, listen, I'm willing to give up this. Okay, if I can go ahead and get this man that's making... $30 an hour, $18 an hour. If I'm making $7 an hour and I can go ahead and get with him, then my, my problem will go away. And then the, the thing that the, the deception of the enemy tells believers is that you can just repent. You know, you get the man and you can just repent from within the relationship. And so now you can still have the man and, you know, and, and the blood of Jesus covers you. And the thing about it, repentance is repentance is, is, is more than saying, I'm sorry. Right. You, you, sure, you're covered by the blood, but repentance does not change the fact that you're in a demonic economy, which you're which is going to cause you to reap a lot of hell on earth. How you try not to go to hell, you know, when you die, but you were willing to live in hell on earth. And so you end up putting you end up putting into the into the satanic system and then you keep reaping from that system and everything that comes from that system has a bow attached to it. This is why God said when God blesses you, he said, I will add no sorrow to it. It is to get you to understand that when the enemy gives you something, there is sorrow test that's going to be attached to it because you're in the wrong system. You are drawing from the wrong economy. You're drawing from the wrong economy. And every economy has taxes. Do with that as you may. Every economy is going to require you that you give something up in order to get something. Let's move on. Number eight, demons participate in trade as well. They love to force and manipulate people to give their strength their weaknesses and their demons to other people. I'm going I'm to make it make sense. No worries. Demons participate in trade as well. This is whenever they have access to a soul, when they have access to a body. Demons, demons protect, participate in trade as well. They love to force and manipulate people to give up their strength. So when you're sleeping with somebody, you're giving up your strength to the men of God. God said that whenever you sleep with a harlot, uh, she will reduce you to a crust of bread. You, that mean you, She makes you devourable, right? Saying goes about seeking whom he may devour. She's going to reduce you. She's going to bring you down. She's going to bring you into captivity. She's going to, to, to Delilah, you, Delilah you. She's going to take away your strength. Remember what Delilah did? She cut off Samson's hair. And so she made, she caused him to lose his virtue. She caused him to lose his strength. And when he lost his strength, those uh, Philistines, which are, uh, you know, they, they are representatives of demons or typologies of demons. Those Philistines were able to come and take him into captivity and then they gouged out his eyes, which is a representation of being blind in the remnant of the spirit, being blind in the remnant of the spirit. So now all of a sudden, whereas you were a prophet, you're not seeing visions anymore. Uh, whereas you were a prophet, you may not necessarily be hearing from God and you can't discern the voice of God because you can't see who's talking to you. Demons participate in trade as well. They love to force or manipulate people to give up their strength. And you can say manipulate. And there's another word for manipulate is seduce. People to give up their strength, their weaknesses, the things that make you weak. The enemy um, wants you to make him aware of it, but freedom to give up their weaknesses and their demons to other people. So when you're sleeping with somebody, trust me when I tell you, the enemy is it, not whenever you're tempted. And I have to talk to my brothers in Christ real quick. 
because y'all deal with lust. Women deal with lust as well. Let's, let's not get it twisted. But a lot of times, women, most of us, for the most part, even when we're broken, most women don't walk around looking at me and say, dang, I want to hit that. Mm -mm -mm. We don't deal with that. Typically, we look at a man and say, oh, he look good. I like to get to know him. We ain't thinking about the dangling. We ain't thinking about nothing like that. But a lot of times what you do is you go into captivity here. And anytime the enemy is able to capture you here, he's going to capture you down there as well. Once he captured you here. If you look upon a woman to lust after her in your heart, you are you have already created this, you have already committed the sin of adultery. When you a woman pass by and you notice from the front that she got them curves, which lets you know that from the back she's probably you know she's slamming as you would want to say. When you look, when you take a look back, you go into captivity. I have to keep, when you take a look back, when you take that moment to to look right then and there. You've already committed the sin of adultery because you're not looking at her to say, that's my sister in Christ. I cover her with the blood of Jesus. You're looking at her to lust after her. Where was I? Demons participate in trade as well. They love to force and manipulate people to give up their strength, their weaknesses, and their demons. And so sometimes what's, it was in you, if you have a spirit of lust or you have something in you, what it's doing is sometimes... What's in her can be pulling on what's in you. I really want you to hear that. Sometimes what's in her, sometimes when you look back, it's what's in you that's looking back. When she looked back, it's what's in her that's looking back. Y'all are not interested in each other. You don't know each other. You're physically attracted to one another, but spiritually speaking, you may be attracted to one another as well. It could be something in you that's attracted to what's in her. And so now basically your, your demons want to trade. That's what I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to make is that those spirits want to trade. Demons can identify each other, right? They can identify if somebody walked by me and if I'm full of demons, the, the demons in that person can identify. Now, it's not that they can see the demon. The, the spirits show up on your continents and they show up through your behavior. They show up the way you walk. They show up in so many different ways, right? You ever seen a woman that's got this real wiggly walk or what have you? You just walk, you're like, dang, you putting them hips up into it or what have you? And she walks really seductively. Well, that's how a spirit can, can identify that, you know, there's lust in them hips. There's there, 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 there's a perversion up in that woman. Even if she's Christian, there's still something there. There's still something there. So demons can identify um, whenever you look at somebody with your eyes. Sometimes it's the way you look at a person. I can look at a woman and I can tell, for example, that when I look at a woman and I can see her looking at a man, for example, I can tell what she's doing I can, because I used to be. Uh, in the world, I used to be a seductress. I used to be broken. And so when I see a woman, especially like at church or what have you, you see a single girl pass by a single man or a married man. And she's like, thank you. And she does her eyes like that. That's spiritual. It's natural, but it's spiritual. The war is not against flesh and blood, but against the powers and the principalities and the rulers of this dark world and spiritual wickedness in high places. And so if he is filled with lust and perversion, that spirit in him is going to identify what she just did. That spirit in him is going to identify what she just did. So let's say, for example, he says, um, I found a phone. Is this your phone? And she got, she takes, she says, yeah, that's fine. And she says, thank you. And he walk, she walks away. Now, if he ain't bound, he'll look at him and be like, you're welcome. And he'll go on about his business. If he's bound, talk, take this from somebody that was in the world. If he's bound, he going to be like, you're welcome. And he's going to watch as she walk away. From that point on, anytime he see her, he's going to come up to her and he'll be like, how you doing? How you, how, how you doing? So a spirit can show up in what you wear. I shouldn't be able to wear what I want. You know, these men need to control themselves. It is, I want to say it's funny, but it's also not funny how demons play with people. Realistically speaking, since the biblical days, your clothes have always been used as a source of communication. Since the biblical days, what you wore has always been used to communicate. There was the garment of a wife. You can only wear this garment if you were a wife. There was a garment of a virgin. You can only wear that garment if you were a virgin. There, were, in every, there was a garment that a widow would wear. You can only wear that if you were a widow. But guess what? There was a garment of a harlot as well. You know what a gar garment of a harlot was? Anything in between. Anything in between. She, it was illegal.
for it, it was immoral, illegal for a woman that had had sex, had intercourse, to put on a garment of a virgin. She couldn't do that. Then to put on a garment of a wife, she couldn't do that. To put on a garment of a widow, she couldn't do that. So she just basically went out of some clothes, man. She just had to wear whatever. And that was considered the gar that, that was the garment of a of, of, of a whore or the garment of a harlot. Your clothes, when a man saw her, he was able to identify her marital status. He was ever he was able to identify. If you come into medieval medieval times, in medieval times, you know, certain clothes let you let people know your profession. As a matter of fact, your last name in medieval times had everything to do with your profession. Last name Butler, that your, your family was butlers, right? And so typically, whatever your 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 profession was, your your family would carry on that name because you it was hard. And in many cases, nearly impossible, if not impossible, to trade over uh, to come from being a butler to being something else, for example. And so that would be your surname is Butler. You would be like, I'm Buckner. So I could be Tiffany the Buckner. Oh, what happened? I could be Tiffany the Buckner. What was I? My demons are always looking to trade. They're always looking to trade. Let's just move on. Number nine. Some demons work better with others. For this reason, demons strategically create strongholds that we refer to as I just create a stronghold that we refer to as our type. Right. Thank you. How you dress does communicate with others. People will sit there and argue all day long. I wear this because I like it. Lies. You wear clothes that you like, but everything that you wear is designed to communicate. We do it subconsciously. We're communicating with our clothes. We're communicating. So if you look at me right now, you see I got on this shirt, right? And you see jewelry, you see this or what have you. All of this, what does it communicate? It communicates that I'm a creative. I like colors. I'm a colorful person. I happen to like colors. I put it on my eyes or what have you. That communicates. Well, how I wear my hair can communicate. Different things that we do communicate. If a woman comes out and a bra and panty set, you know, she calls it a swimsuit, it's still communicating. You ain't getting in the water. It's still communicating. And especially she go to wiggling them hips. And what women have a tendency to do, men men as well, but especially women, what we have a tendency to do as women is that we'll wear stuff that's designed to communicate, but then we get mad when we get a response from the wrong man. We, we get mad. See, we sitting up over there. That's why the song came out, I Don't Want No Scrub. Because we're sitting in the, back, the passenger side of his, back, hanging out the passenger side of his best friend's ride trying to holler at me because what we're communicating or what they're communicating in that song is I want the driver. I want the one with the car. That's the one that I like. And every woman has been through that. Every woman I've been in the world, y'all, every woman has been through that where you put on certain clothes and you see a guy, right? And you know, guy code, guy code is something they do subconsciously, something they don't do, something they do where they're not communicating, but um, they don't communicate it, but it's, it's like unwritten. Uh, whereas if his boy trying to holler at you, a lot of times he'll fall back. His boy trying to holler at you and it gets frustrating because you checking out the dude. And you're like, dang, he's cute. I hope he approached me. I like him. I hope he approached me. But then it's always that one. It's always that Tyrone, the loud one or what have you. It's always that one that's got gold in his mouth or misses a, a few teeth. The, the loud one, the aggressive one. And you wonder how he come up with it. Hey, hey, hey. And you're just like. <sighs> now I got a line say I got a man. Now I gotta sit here and say I got a man just to get you away from me. And now I'm mad because you just ruined you ruined my chances with him. And because now he's following guy code or what have you. He following guy code. Let's move on. But some demons work better with others for this reason. For this reason, demons strategically create a stronghold that we refer to as our type. They create a stronghold. Your type is usually a familiar spirit that you are used to and attracted to. Familiar spirits come in to become familiar with you and to get you familiar with them. They want to become familiar with you and they want to get you familiar with them. That's why God said, remember he says, um, many will come to me in that day. They will say, then we cast out devils in your name. Uh, then we prophesy in your name. Then we cast out devils. And he will say, get away from me for I never knew you. That has everything to do with heart knowledge, right? I, like I said, you can have head knowledge versus you can have heart knowledge. That means the person had no intimate relationship. And so what the enemy seeks to do is to have an intimate relationship with you. So you won't have an intimate relationship with God. Um, but some demons work better with others for this reason. They strategically create a stronghold that we refer to as our type. So it becomes a familiar spirit. Whereas you can see a guy and you just like. I like him. And your friend just said, girl, he looked like the dude you used to date. 
He, he do to you. He does. And then he come over there. He has the same personality. He comes over there and he has like some things about it. And then you like, he do. He kind of does. He, 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 but in more in a sexy way. Oh, what have you? Realistically speaking, you're not, you weren't attracted to your ex. You're attracted to that spirit. So if I have a need, like, for example, if my body needs vitamin D, in many cases, my, my body may say, I want orange juice. If my body needs potassium, I may start having a craving for bananas. Whatever you have a need for, there's going to be a craving for, right? And so this is how demons work. Every, just like when you're born, you have an assignment from God. While you're in the, your parents' room, your mother womb, you have an assignment from God. Devils give you assignment as well. Uh, the Satan, Satan will give you an assignment. Demons will have something that you're assigned to do in the earth, whether that is to make sure that you are an adulteress and that you destroy marriages. That is the, the devil's agenda. So for every assignment, I want you to look at it as a, as a cooked dish, right? It's a dish. If I'm going to cook, let's say chicken yolky soup, I, I need to cook that soon. But if I wanted to cook chicken yolky soup, there are certain ingredients that I need to, to get the soup. So I'm going to have to go and trade. I'm going to have to go to the store and I'm going to have to buy those ingredients that I don't have. And I have to give them money in exchange and basically time because time is money. I got that money through me spending time working. So I'm going to have to give them that money in exchange for the ingredients for the chicken gnocchi soup. So whenever the enemy, let's say he says that you're going to be a seductress that destroys marriages, like I'm going to break you forward. So typically during that, what you may, what may happen is you probably molested in your childhood. A lot of things where the enemy started to break your relationship with your body. Right. So that you don't see your body as sacred anymore. He started to basically train you. So you, you just see your body as a tool to get what you want. And let's say you have specific demons in order to accomplish this. There are other demons that you're going to need. There are other demons that you're going to need. I mean, it's not always a mandate, but for the most part, it makes it a lot easier. There are certain demons that you need. So what's in you, what familiar spirits are in you can start to look for those demons and other people. What's in you can like what's in him. Does that make sense? What's in you can like what's in him. You, what's in you can be like Leviathan. Because you see, even though she broken and she was molested and she was rejected, she looked too, you know, she looked too given. We need a little bit more pride in this one. We need we need her to be a little bit more stubborn because she got to save mama or she got to save somebody. So those demons may say we need Leviathan and you pass by somebody that's got Leviathan and Leviathan is going to set the stage for Leviathan you pass by somebody and now because you're timid and you're fearful and all that but you super false meekness fear and you're sitting up over there and you're just like this uh -huh, yeah and then this man come up and he has this Leviathan spear and he's like what's up with you and he got all that pride but it looks like confidence he comes up to you and it makes you feel like somebody you said say could be Leviathan, right? It could be Leviathan. He makes you feel safe because he's got confidence. When you have insecurity and fear, you feel exposed. You feel wide open. And so now he comes up to you and he makes you feel safe. And from there, I want, I want him. I like him. And his demons will say, I like that she's submissive. I like that she's this. I like that she's that. So you start forming this allegiance. Remember, we talked about kingdoms merging together. You are a kingdom. The other person that comes into your life is a kingdom. Kingdoms merging together so that you can trade. So now your demons and his demons can commune with one another and they can make whatever, tra whatever trades. His demons can say, hey, this is what we need over here. We need this spirit and that spirit. We need this stronghold and that stronghold. And then your spirits can say, hey, we need this spirit and that spirit, that, st that spirit or what have you. After the trade is complete, what the enemy will do, and I, this, this is a part of my notes, but we'll, we'll get to that bridge when we cross it, um, before we cross it. what When the devil wants you out of a relationship, he will torment your mind. He, he think he better. Look at the side. Of, I don't know why his head is wop-sided. Why he chew like Mr. Ed? And you know, the, demon, the devil will start to inundate you with a bunch of negative thoughts, and he'll do the same thing to the other person whenever he wants to drive you out of a relationship. But some demons work better with others for this reason. Demons strategically create a stronghold that we refer to as our type. So we mess around and we like, I like this type of man. Like, I, let me say this. 
and I'm gonna be I'm gonna keep it real. A lot of women, I'm but also them, because they never felt safe, because they never felt protected by parents, are attracted to Leviathan. I'm gonna let that I, I want to let that silence sit there for a second. Because I used to be attracted to that spirit. A lot of women, because they never felt safe, they never felt protected. They never felt like I can be weak enough. I can be feminine. Like I'm always having to, to protect myself. I'm always having to build something and do something. I'm always having to be the doer. Everywhere I go, I'm the doer. But then you come across somebody that's arrogant. And let's say he's a little bit taller than you because you know that melts our knees. But he, he come up to you and he say, what you up to? And he look down on you and he got all that masculine energy. And a Leviathan, and you know what? What's in you can be attracted to Leviathan. What's in you can be attracted to Leviathan. And the next thing you know, you end up with a Leviathan, uh, a Leviathan spirit by proxy, meaning you're associating. So now this Leviathan spirit in him is guarding you and you end up feeling safe because you're being guarded by a demon. Now, at some point, the enemy's going to say, give me back my dude. And the, the, the enemy's going to say, I need you back because there's another man that you have some demons in you through your trade that this man doesn't have. And there are some demons in this guy through his trade with you and his trade with other women that that sister over there doesn't have. And so those demons, all of a sudden, the, the enemy starts to create a rift between y'all. The enemy breaks you up because you are, to the enemy, nothing but livestock. That's it. You know, in livestock, a lot of times, I, I, I watch this lady on TikTok all the time, and she brings in animals to mate with her animals, for example. She bought in a, and I'm an animal lover, so I'm a weirdo. I like to watch things with animals and what have you. And, it, you know, she just, her, her whole thing is about animals, her whole thing. And her name is Katie Psych or what have you. So she has, you know, uh, like four or five million followers. So it's basically just, you go look at her thing. She has horses. Oh, what have you? One time, probably six months ago, she bought in a donkey, a male donkey. She has two female donkeys. She wants to grow her livestock. She wants to create more livestock. So she bought in a male donkey to mate with her female donkeys. She bought in a male donkey. He stayed there for a few months. She recently bought in a goat to mate with her goats because that's what they do. They trade. They make money by that. And what have you? They make money that way. And so a lot of times, and I found out watching her channel that, and I don't know if it's just her, but I found out watching her channel, a lot of farmers, especially those who, you know, are looking to trade, they prefer female animals because they want to be able to produce more animals that they can sell or what have you. Demons work the same way. Demons are always trying to find some type of way to reproduce themselves. They're always trying to find some type of way to find people who are receptive of them or what have you. Let me get back to my point. Let me get back over here. Some demons work better with others for this reason. Demons strategically create a stronghold that we refer to as our type, right? It gives an illusion of protection, but most of the time when you're dealing with Leviathan, that's who you have to be protected from because that same man will beat you. That same man will do a lot of crazy stuff to you because Leviathan is a guarding spirit. You guys, one of the books you should get is my, my latest book, it is called The Before and Aftertaste of Deliverance. It held number one. It's book one and book two. So there are two books to it. The Book of Knowledge, which is book one. The Book of Understanding, which is book two. It held the number one position for well over a week. For well over a week. So go and get those books if you want to learn more about demonology. All right. It was on the bestsellers list. I am truly grateful. So thank you for everybody that has purchased that book. But some demons work better. I need to move on from here with others for this reason. Uh, demon strategically create a stronghold that we refer to as our type. You come across this guy and you, you see him in a crowd and it's like, that's my type. Or a guy, you can see a female and she's standing in the crowd and she ain't the baddest one in the crowd. She ain't the prettiest one in the crowd, but it's just something about her. It's something about her that makes us stand out. It's something about her that makes you sexy to you. I don't know what it is about that girl, but I, I really like her. But in many cases, it could be spiritual. In many cases, it could be an unclean spirit that's in you that needs what's in her. That wants what's in her. And again, what what how you are identifying it is the fact that she's sitting back, for example, and insecurity. 
and the fact that the way that she's doing the, the clothes that she's wearing, the, the way her facial expressions, all of these things communicate. And so your spirit, whatever unclean spirit you have, can identify that she got this spirit and that spirit and that spirit based on her presentation before she opens her mouth. Now, if she opens her mouth, then there's confirmation that comes out of that because she may open her mouth and she may sound scared. She may open her mouth and she may say stuff that's freaky. She may be that friend that she doesn't feel that pretty, but then she feels like she's freakier than the rest of her friends. So she may sit back and say something nasty to you. But realistically speaking, uh, or the point that I'm making is, is that you will identify, just like the Bible said, you will know them by their fruits. Demons identify you by your fruits as well. They identify you by your issues. All right, let's move on. Number 10. When a demon is weak, it can and does cry out to the demonic kingdom for help. Thank you, Sister Mary. God bless you, beautiful. When a demon is weak, it can and does cry out to the demonic kingdom for help. How do I know this? I'm in the ministry of deliverance. I've had I've taken people through deliverance many times, especially in a public setting. Uh, you will hear the, per the demon start screaming out. The person said, help me, help me, help me. That's an unclean spirit. And that person is screaming out for help from an un another unclean spirit. So it's not just it, this doesn't just happen when people are manifesting and going through deliverance. Whenever a demon is weak, every demon has to be fed. Whatever you feed will grow, whatever you starve will die. In order for a demon to stay in you, it has to be fed. So if you got a spirit of lust in you, it has to be fed. So it's going to create an appetite, right? So that you can get aroused. It's going to create an appetite so that you can do this. And let's say you happen to be a believer and you know what? You're fighting a good fight. You decide I'm not giving in to that no more, but you ain't got you ain't gonna do deliverance yet. But you're you're working against a stronghold, which is good because James 4 7 switches yourself to God, resist, resist the devil, he will flee from you. So you can get deliverance through you resisting the enemy. You don't always have to go and submit yourself to deliverance. I highly recommend deliverance, but a lot of demons that you're gonna get uh delivered from, they don't get delivered at the altar of deliverance, they get delivered at the altar of sacrifice. This is when you sit back and you Romans 12 1 the devil, for example. Present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. So now you found yourself aroused and you say, I'm going to take Sister Tiffany's advice and I'm going to put on some worship music. You get out that bed right there in that moment and you put the worship music on and you begin to worship. You begin to praise God. You begin to thank God until Mr. Winky falls down or until that arousal goes away. You you begin to praise and you begin to worship God. And so what, what that's doing is now that spirit hasn't been fed. It's still there, but it hasn't been fed. And so now it's sitting there and it's hungry. It's, it's sitting there or it may flee from you. doesn't mean it ain't going to come back, but it may flee from you. But it's sitting there and it's hungry and it's getting weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker. That spirit can cry out for lust. If it's not cast out, it can cry out for love, for help. So, for example, you've been absent in three years, but you never got delivered from the spirit of lust. You never got delivered from the spirit of perversion. You come in contact with this guy and he just, you know, every time he sees you, he's just like, and you're like, You feeling good? You feeling yourself or what have you? What's in him? Your demon could be crying out to what's in him. He don't hear it. He don't know that. He ain't in a, he's not at home possessed in front of a mirror talking about will do. No, this is a human being walking around who also needs deliverance. And so what's in him can all of a sudden be drawn to you because your demon is hollering out for help me. The spirit of lust, the spirit of perversion, the spirit of lasciviousness can be saying, help me, help me, help me. Now you found yourself in a relationship or dating this guy, and he's going, so you want to let me come over? No, boy, I'm abstinent. I can't let you come over. You got to be like that, man. Yeah, I respect your abstinence. You know, I just want to hang with you. You know, just talk to you, see, you know, I, 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 I ain't been like FaceTime. I can FaceTime you. No, man, no. Oh, what have you? And if you're silly enough, if you're, if, if you're unwise enough, you'll let that joker come over to your house. And the next thing you know, he's going to keep doing everything, knowing that you wrapped in flesh. I don't care how many times you say, no, your, your body is not Christian. <laughs> your body don't care. Your body has no inheritance with God. Your body doesn't care. So that's what the enemy understands. If I can get him over into her space, if I can get her to come over to his house, if I can get her aroused, because the Bible said flee fornication. Most of y'all not going to do that. That means if I'm sitting up in the house and I told you guys, and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to tell the entirety of this story. When I worked for a magazine some uh, 15 odd years ago, right? Got hired onto a magazine, small magazine. One of the guys there, well, the guy, the main guy that was there had a crush. He had a girlfriend. I had a husband. He had a crush on me, right? But you got to understand every attraction is not I'm attracted to your mind. 
there's such thing as a sexual attraction, right? That his demon was likely attracted to what I had in me, right? And while I was in the office with this man, working with him one day, we just often working side by side. And, you know, I noticed that we're so close together. I, I could feel his shirt rubbing up against mine. I could feel our arms rubbing. And I'm typing. I'm trying to type this stuff for the magazine. I'm just typing. And then I started noticing that I'm being distracted. So I'm typing slower. Then I noticed he started typing slower. And I felt the atmosphere shift or what have you. And right there in that moment, I'm just sitting up there looking. And I had the thought, I realized that, Tiffany, if you don't get up out of here, something's about to go down. Your body don't care about your husband. Your heart does. Somebody get it. Your body don't care about your husband. Your body don't care about God. It has no inheritance with God. Your heart does. If you don't get up out of here, something's about to go down. So I literally jumped from my street seat. I grabbed my purse and I took off running. I was running. I remember running. He was like, Tiffany, what's going on, Tiffany? I said, I'll call you. That's all I said to him. I'll call you. And I got myself in my car and I called and I said, hey, I'm sorry. I just needed to get out of there. I got to go work on some stuff or what have you. I didn't tell him, you know, hey, I was struggling with lust and I could tell you were getting around too. I felt that in the atmosphere. When you flee for fornication, you, you got you to gotta look like a donkey for real. That means you can't worry about how you look in that moment. You got to get your tail up. If you sitting up there trying to figure a way to get up out of there, no, nah, I don't want him to feel no type of way or what have you. You're going to get God because he's going to get up from that seat and you sitting up there. He's like, why you keep getting up? And he's going to slowly he gonna stretch and move up his way over there to you. Next thing you know, you kiss and next thing you know, your body is getting engaged and your body gets stronger. Your flesh gets stronger. That desire gets stronger. That lust gets stronger. Until you find yourself doing something that you weren't supposed to do. You got to always remember this. I, I dare you to write this down somewhere. My body doesn't care for my spouse. My body don't care for God. My body will tremble in his presence. I'm a spirit inside of a body. He cheated on me. His body don't care nothing about you. His body don't care nothing about you. That's why you got to get to his mind. Hey, you don't talk to another uh, other female. Don't do this. Don't do that. You won't trust me. I don't trust your body. I can't even trust my body. Why would I trust yours? Why would I not trust? Why would I trust in your flesh when I can't trust in my own flesh? This stuff has no inheritance with God. This stuff don't care. If, if I let this thing tell me what to do, it will tell me, Tiffany, I need you to go on a spread. I need you to I'll eat the whole freaking buffet fornicate all day long touch yourself do this do that if i let this stuff tell me what to do i just don't let my body jezebel me i don't let my body jezebel me your body ain't saved your body don't care nothing about god your body don't care nothing about your spouse your your your, your flesh ain't in the house talking about some i really love my wife no your flesh say i'm horny that's all he says he said i'm horny and i want to do it that's that's it and then that's when the enemy starts to engage your mind. You feel that, that hunger or what have you. And if you're not careful, if you're in the wrong atmosphere, if you're around the wrong person, when that appetite, when that thing wakes up, when that demon starts crying out for attention, you may find yourself folded up like a pretzel. All right. But when a demon is weak, it can and it does cry out for help from the, from the demonic kingdom. So that means that the enemy will try to strategically place somebody in your life. Right. A demon will put strategically cause you to be attracted or drawn to somebody that has the demon that your body or that your soul is in need of. All right. Let's move on. Number 11. When Satan rebelled against God, along with one third of God's fallen angels, he was hoping to make a deal with God. That's right. The Bible tells us it talks about bad association, corrupts good manners. When Satan rebelled against God, along with one third of God's uh one third of God's fallen angels, he was hoping to make a deal with God. He knew he couldn't just take over. He was hoping. And I, I found this to be true in relationship. You ever notice when you get in a relationship with somebody who's demonized, somebody who's broken, somebody who's not godly, somebody who's not fully surrendered to God, somebody who's self-centered. A lot of times what ends up happening, they, they move just like they the, the devil, right? Uh, whether Satan is their father or if they just still dealing with the struggles of life, if they they're still dealing with strongholds that they never addressed or what have you. One of the things that you'll notice is that a spirit will hold them over your head. If you pay attention, it's all spiritual. A spirit will hold them over your head. And what that means is, let's say you happen to be married to a woman. For example, to my brothers in Christ, you happen to be married to a woman. And that woman starts demanding her freedom. And so something in her is not content with you. And so she said back, when I say demanding her freedom, I'm not saying that she shouldn't have freedom. What I'm talking about, 
She wants something that's excessive. She wants to be able to come in at three, four, five in the morning. She wants to be able to leave and go on long trips without you. And she don't feel like she should have to communicate because she said, I'm grown, right? She says, I'm grown. But what ends up happening is that spirit in her, because as a husband, you have to put down a law. That's not okay. And I'm not accepting that. As for me at my house, we're going to serve the Lord. I don't know what you're struggling with. I don't know what's going on in your life or what have you. But you know deep down inside that she's having an extramarital affair, that she has an appetite for other men or what have you. You have to set order, right? You have to set order. And if she's not willing to fulfill or to abide by that order, then what you have to do is you have to cast her out like a demon. If she cheats on you, you cast her out, right? If, 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 if Same truth to the woman. If he cheats, you cast her out like a demon, especially if that person is unrepentant you know if that person just constantly keep going back i don't want to have you if the person keep going back i'm not saying that they do it one time or what have you they got caught up their body don't love you or what have you they didn't use wisdom you get counseling and then you you develop a strategy but whenever an unclean spirit is in let's say for example to the brother of christ if it's in a woman and that woman starts making demands and then she starts threatening to leave you what's literally happening happening in that moment is the devil is holding her over your head so it's basically like, let me use her. If you want to keep her, because Satan is saying she's a part of my economy. She's a part of my con economy. I decided when she was a little girl that she was going to be used to capture men. And you messed around and you got to her head and you got in her heart. And now you got her. And if you want to keep her, then what you're going to have to do is you're going to let her go out. You got to go out. Go, you're going to have to let her go out there and do her thing. And then I'll let her keep coming home to you. Keep coming home, bring whatever she didn't count out there whether it's a disease or a demon or, you know, all the issues and the strongholds, she come back with all that stuff. I'll let you keep her. I've seen this happen too many times. Whereas a male can be cheating on his wife or a wife can be cheating on her husband and the enemy is holding the other person over the person's head and they keep on fighting for the marriage. Whereas the other person is not fighting. They're too busy fighting against the marriage and running away from the marriage. And while they're running away, the objective, and this is a false Elijah, a false Elisha, the objective is to get the person to chase them because when you're chasing them, the enemy is trying to get you to chase them. I, remember, we talked about the siege, right? The objective was to drive you out of the cap, the, the kingdom, to drive you out of the castle, um, and what have you, to get you out there so that you can be taken into captivity or slaughter. The objective of the running of the runner is to get you to chase her or to get you to chase him so that you can go into captivity, so that you can go into sin because of your desperation. You end up having a drought. So you start drinking, you start doing, you start drinking alcohol. You go, you go into a club, you start having, you start doing everything in an attempt to, 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 to treat your heart, to treat your pain or what have you. But the objective of the runner in many of these cases is to get you to chase them. This is why you don't chase. This is why God said, if the unbelieving depart, wants, if the unbelieving spouse wants to depart, what did He say to do to him? He said, "Let them depart." If the unbeliever wants to depart, let them depart. If they want to go, because God understands spirituality, because He is a spirit, so God understands that. If that person is playing that game, it's a mind game. It's a game of psychology. What that person is doing is that person is controlling you. That person is saying because the devil put an appetite in them. And so that person is they're running because you're not feeding something in me. You're not feeding me this. You're not giving me that. So that, spirit, that person goes on a run and then you go after that's a false Elijah and you end up becoming this Elisha. And then you're going to run out there and get cut, taken into captivity. You run out there and you get taken into captivity. You give people the freedom of will. Somebody says, I'm leaving you. You say, I hate that. Want counseling? No, I want counseling. I don't want you. I don't want this. Ain't nothing you can do about that. That's their will. You can pray. You can talk to the Lord. You can say, God, I think my, 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 my husband is bound. I think this is going on. God, I think my wife is bound. I know this is what's going on. But God, not by you. Because if they're running from me, then they're running from you. This ain't a problem. You have to understand this. I gotta, I'm going to get back into this. It, it is rarely, uh, let me say this, it is never a problem between you and another person. It is almost always a problem between God and that person. It is rarely a problem when you get married, you have anything that God brings together. It is not a problem between flesh or souls. It's a, always a problem that's spiritual. The war is not against flesh and blood but against powers and principalities and the rulers of this dark world and spiritual wickedness in high places. It is not a war that you're fighting with a person. 
It is a war between that person and God. Because the enemy, hear me, in many cases, is taking a person and bringing them back into his economy. Because he's saying, I have need of this person. Like God says about us, I have need of thee. What the enemy is saying, I have need of this person. There, there is something I put in this, in this man that I can use. There is something I put in this woman that I can use. And I'm not about to let them waste it on you. Number 12, I think we are. And then that, just to close that statement out, the enemy is trying to get them to make a deal. So a lot of times people start making a deal. Okay, what do you want? i just saying, I feel like you should trust me. If I want to go out, I should be able to go out. I'm a grown woman. And then that man gives in. He's make, he making a deal with the devil. <laughs> he making a deal with the devil. He gives in. I feel like, and I feel, this one, you know, you're making a deal with the devil and you keep hearing, I feel, I feel, I feel, I feel. No, you had to sit back and say, I release you. I release you like the, the butterfly you want to be. I release you, okay? I release you and I hate it. I'm going to grieve and I'm going to get counseling and I'm going to forgive, but I release you because at the end of the day, it is not the will of God for me to, to, to hold you captive. It's not the will of God. If you feel like there's something out there that you're not getting from me, then I release you. But just so you know, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be open for you to come back. I'm not going to be open for you to come back. All right, let's move on. Number 12, sexually transmitted de demons can and do enter through sexual intercourse, masturbation, illicit conversations, pornography, etc. We're not going to stay there long because I think that's kind of self-explanatory. Tra sexually transmitted demons can and do enter. So it's not, it doesn't always have to be sexual contact, but they can come in through sexual contact, of course. Masturbation, when you're touching yourself, you're opening yourself up for tra sexually transmitted demons, demons because you're not utilizing the fruit of self-control. Illicit conversations, pornography, and basically anything that arises, arouses you. Right. If he becomes a doormat, the woman won't respect him. A woman uh, that doesn't respect her husband, the Bible says that uh, wives respect your husbands. Um, if, if, she, if he allows that, then what ends up happening is she has no respect for him. She will continue to demonize the man. She'll continue to break him until she destroys him. She'll break him starting at the back. And the, the, she'll break his spine or what have you. And so the enemy will weaken him. And then consequently, what ends up happening is the enemy can break, reduce him to the point where the enemy can take him out. Or the enemy could um, basically turn him into a useless Ahab. And the enemy doesn't have, he ends up in captivity just like Samson was. And he, there's literally nothing he can do besides shut corn. But sexually transmitted demons can and do enter through sexual intercourse, masturbation. For those of you struggling, struggling with masturbation, that's a demon in many cases that's looking to be fed. Um, illicit conversations, pornography, and all things that are perverse. Number 13, sexually transmitted demons are used by the enemy to create a bridge between two people that would allow their demons to trade with one another. And I got one that's pretty much the same, so I'm going to... Uh, likely cut out a step but sexually transmitted demons are used by the enemy to create a bridge this bridge is called a soul tie sexually transmitted demons are used by the enemy to create a bridge between the people that are that allow that that between two people that would allow their demons to trade we wanted to let them read that again because i stumbled sexually transmitted de demons are used by the enemy to create a bridge between two people that would allow their demons to trade with one another that allow their demons to trade with one another. So whenever, you know, if your demon, like I told you, we, we talked about this. If your demon has a need, if you're um, in his system, then it's looking to trade with another person. It's going to look to trade with the demons and another person. Um, and in order to accomplish this, it has to get you to establish a soul tie. And the soul tie has to be illegal. It has to be illegal, an ungodly soul tie. All right. Demons cannot cross over legal soul ties. Somebody needs to hear that. Godly soul ties, demons cannot cross over those soul ties because the, those bridges are like surrounded by fire. Demons can't cross. They have to cross. They have to utilize the illegal soul ties. And you could be married to somebody. You could form a godly soul tie with your spouse, but then you could turn around and form an ungodly soul tie with your spouse called unforgiveness. For example, if a demon is in your spouse and let's say he is out there thotting it out and uh, there's a spirit up in him of lust or what have you, he's doing a lot of things. You end up fighting with him, contending with him, and the next thing you know, you find yourself in unforgiveness toward him. And while you're walking in that unforgiveness, that does give the demons in him a legal, give those demons in him a 
access to the 60 fold of you. Whereas they were in the 30 fold, you know, because you're living in the house with him, they were in the 30 fold, which means they were messing with your mind. And once they get into the 60 fold, they're now in your heart. So now you find yourself in need of deliverance and you find yourself hurt and you find yourself being tormented by the same demons that have been tormenting him. Number 14, sexually transmitted demons set the stage for demonic covenants to be established through the uniting of the two bodies or two, two souls as one. Once an agreement is in place, the strong man can rule both souls. That was a little bit hard to pick apart. Uh, it will take a, a while to pick apart it, so hopefully you get it. But sexually transmitted demons, what's that? That's number 14. Set the stage for demonic covenants. They want a covenant. They don't want to just get in. They want to have an agreement. They want to have some type of bond to be established. So that what they're doing is through the relationship a lot of times we start making oaths with people. We start creating contracts with our words because what you say to a person, any promise you say is a promissory note, otherwise known as a contract. So when you start saying like it's yours and I'll never leave you and I'm going to be with you for the rest of my life and you, you're my world, you're my rock, all of these things, you are literally creating a contract with that person. And what the enemy likes to do is he likes to get that contract and get it to come into, to get, get that contract and use that um, as a covenant or to use that as an agreement against you. Uh, but he wants to use that to establish. So the united, through the uniting of two bodies or two souls as one. So the enemy is trying to make you guys one land, one territory, one kingdom. Once an agreement is in place, the strong man can rule both souls. So what's in her can rule you, brother and God, brother in Christ. What's in her when you when you find yourself in a friendship, a relationship, or anything? If that person is demonized, let's say that their strong man outranks your strong man, or if you don't have a strong man, you don't have demons at all. That spirit in them is going to seek to rule you. Realistically speaking, the return of the unclean spirit, God, you got to hear me. If a demon can't get in you, it'll attach itself to you. And it can attach itself to you through your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your spouse, your best friend. It can attach itself to you through people. And so what, what an unclean spirit does is it's always trying to find some type of way to attach or to reattach itself to you. Once an agreement is in place, a strong man can... can rule over both souls so that strong man that's in that man for example can rule over you it can rule over you or the strong man that's in that woman can rule over you through the use of that woman or through the use of that man number 15 yeah 15 sexually transmitted demons will always use the spirits of lust and idolatry as their stomachs and if you one thing you'll know if you're if you're in the ministry of deliverance what do we cast the spirit of lust out of from behind the eyes and in the stomach. They typically hide in the stomach. But sexually transmitted demons will always use the spirits of lust and idolatry as their stomachs. This way they can cause the human to lust after or crave specific people or to just crave all manners of people so that the demons, the demon, demonic nature can strengthen itself. I'm going to say it again. Just going back to the biblical days. Whenever a nation or kingdom wanted to overcome another nation or kingdom, they didn't just go after the people who were prospering. They also went after the people who they maybe had a strong military or they just went after them just so they could build their military. They just they, they wanted the numbers. It had nothing to do with the quantity. I mean, the quality it had everything to do with the quantity. Right. And so you will have some you will have a guy out there, a girl out there who they got a high body count. They don't care who they sleep with. They don't care who they sleep with. Then you have some people who have demons that are more strategic. So, for example, let's create two guys. We're going to create Tyrone and we're going to create Terrence. Hopefully you got no Terrence up in here. But we got, you got Tyrone and you got Terrence. Tyrone can be just a thought. His demons are just trying to build up a legion in him, right? His demons, just want, and his demons are hungry. He got a lot of boys. So he needs a lot of affirmation, a lot of reassurance. And Tyrone out there sleeping with everything that got a hole in it. He just sleeping with everything. Then you got Terrence. Terrence is a little bit more strategic. He don't sleep with no every woman. Terrence goes after specific types of women. Um, women that, let's say, for example, he happens to be interested in women in ministry. He happens to be interested in women who have a calling on their life and anointing on their lives and stuff like that. He happens to be interested in those types of people. Or what have you. So you're dealing with two different types of spirits or you're dealing with an appetite you're dealing with an appetite but the demon will cause him to crave specific people or to just crave all manners of people so his demon terrence's demon may be trying to go up and rank or what have you 
It's trying to go up in rank and it's trying to bring. Okay. If anybody I go in subjection or submission to creates a open heaven or a brass heaven over me. Anybody I go in submission to is going to determine what happens. So if I get married and I go into submission to that husband, he can create a brass heaven over my head. And the enemy knows that. He can create a brass heaven or he can create an open heaven over my head. Terrence sounds like a woman. No, but let's say, yeah, there, there are women out there like that, but he can create a brass uh, heaven over my head. If, let's say, if it's Terrence, if Terrence says this, I'm just, I'm just I like the anointing on her life. It could be a spirit, right? And that spirit is not looking at me. That spirit is not, in, that spirit isn't interested in me as, it, as, as much as it is in you. Does that make sense? So that spirit can say, if I bring her into captivity, I can bring all of her followers through a, an event called influence into captivity. So then you may find me on camera wearing something low fitting or, you know, doing little things or what have you, because something in me is saying I want to take to bring these people under influence. So you have Tyrone, who is not that educated. The devil has pretty much decided a long time ago. He's just going to be walking around sleeping with everybody. He ain't going to hardly have no money or no teeth. He's just going to be going around sleeping with everybody. He's going to be poor, sleeping on people's couches all day. So it's like that's what the devil decided for him. He, he's a, to a toss away, but he's still useful to the enemy. But the enemy, that spirit that's in Terrence, for example, can can say, I want to go up in rank. I want to go up in rank. I'm, I want to be, you know, a principality. I want to be this. I want to be that. I want to go up in rank. I want to build. And so it could be a little bit more strategic, whereas you will find that Terrence is strategically going after women of God. He's not going to go after the women that Tyrone goes after. He's not going to go after the women that Tyrone goes after. He's going to go after the women that have high rank. Same is true for women. So people, women can have spirits and they say, hey, no, I want the powerful man. I want the man with the house, the car. I want him to have this. Um, That is totally spiritual. That is totally spiritual because that spirit is saying, hey, listen, if I can get control, if I can get her in the house and I know she don't know how to submit, she's not going to submit. She's not surrendered to God. Then the enemy saying, I can get a spy into your territory. That can spy out your finances, that can spy out just basic, and that can control what basically comes in and out of your life. And she can create a brass heaven over you by, by constantly fighting with you, fighting against you, and slowly but surely through her tantrums and, and her rejection of you, she can slowly but surely bring you into captivity and bring you under her. And that way, you know, you end up being controlled by her. And then there is a brass heaven over there because. In this, God is the head of the husband and the husband is the head of the wife, okay? And because she's not submitted to God, even if she says, I'm Christian, but you can see that she's not Christian by the things that she does, or, or you can see that he's not Christian by the things he does either way. But in that, she effectively brings her husband into submission. She effectively brings him into submission because in order for her, him to have her, he has to go under that brass heaven, Oh, what happened? He, go, he has to go under that brass heaven. What was that? Number 15, I think. Let me see. Now, talking about sexually transmitted demons will always use spirits of lust and idolatry as their stomachs. They will create an appetite. They will create an appetite. So you'll find yourself, you know, all of a sudden, why, why am I feeling, I don't, why do I feel frisky, man? Why do I feel this way? Uh, they'll create that atmosphere, that at that at appetite. I'm trying to say atmosphere and appetite. They'll create an atmosphere so they can set the stage for that appetite. Let's say that. They'll create an atmosphere so they can set the stage. This is why you got to be careful what you let go into your gates. Your ear gates are very important. When you're listening to music that, pro that promotes lust, lust, you have to understand that in order for that person to write that song, that person was under the influence of lust. And so now, because you're listening to that, and you are you idolize that person, you go under the influence of those lyrics. And so it intoxicates you. And so next thing you know, you in your bedroom, you ain't got no man or you ain't got no woman, and you trying to want want you trying to figure out why you feeling so frisky, why you feel so aroused. Um, it's because you allowed that thing to come in and create an appetite. And that appetite can harass you, it can manipulate, it, it can dominate you, it can 
torment you until you give in to it. I think that's the right word. It can torment you until you give in to it, but they're going to always try to create, um, they're going to use the spirits of lust and idolatry. The idolatry is simply this. Matthew 6, 633, submit yourself to God, resist it. No. Matthew 6, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Most Christians, you've heard me say this, they see God, but they don't seek him first. And this is where Christian, this is where you have a lot of Christians who are unbe unbeknownst to them polytheistic, meaning they have multiple gods. They, 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 they claim uh, Jesus Christ is their Lord. And this is why Jesus said, why call me Lord if you're not going to serve me? But they claim Jesus Christ is their Lord. But deep down in their hearts, they're polytheistic because God is not first. So they have multiple gods. God says that thou shalt have no other gods before me. And so what ends up happening is they end up having something else before God. Now, you, some people say, well, Tiffany, can I have another God after God? You won't need one. And so no. And so you end up having you as your God, your feelings as your God, your plans as your God, your preferences as your God, the lust of your body, the lust of your stomach. Uh, the, you know, you, you can have your, your, your penis or your, your, your VJ as your God, your stomach. You're, you're being driven by your, your, your desire. Um, you can have all those different gods or marriage as a God. You can have uh, a, man, a man as a God. You can have a woman as a, a God. You end up having so many different gods. And then you wonder why it seems like you can't get a, an answer from God because you're resting under a brass heaven because you sought God, but you didn't seek him first. You sought God, but you didn't seek him first. Consequently, you have multiple gods. And God says, you know, how it's the same attitude we have is if if a man was me, with me and he left me to be with somebody else. And that joker called me on the phone and he said, hey. Um, can I get $30 because I'm on my lunch break and I'm hungry? It can be easy for me to say, go get it from your girl. Why are you calling me? I would think that's who you would call. Well, she said she ain't got it. Well, that's between you and her. Go call your girl. And God, God does the same thing. He says, go call your guy. You, you, you want it. You want it. You put yourself above me. You put that man before me. You put your desires before me. Why aren't you calling your guy? Why are you calling on me when you have problems? Why, why are you calling on me when you have problems with your God? If it makes me think of this time where this lady, um, and this is when I lived in Florida. This is back in like 2014, a very long time ago. Lady called herself, and I was new to ghostwriting at the time. And she wanted to hire me as a ghostwriter. She called me, just insistent, you know, just called me time, and she just kept calling me to talk about the book she wanted. And she was like, I'm just trying to make sure that you understand. And I'm like, Yeah, cool. And I, you know, she she just kept calling me. Long story short, what ends up happening with this particular lady is she was like, you, can you go down on your price? I said, no, ma'am, because my price is actually very low right now compared to most ghostwriters. I said, the only reason, reason I got, the only reason I got mine so low right now is because I'm starting off. But if I go a bit low, I'm pretty much doing this book for free and I'm not doing that. So she ends up um, hiring somebody else, right? I don't hear from her anymore. I spoke to her probably, probably for two weeks, you know, consistently. She just keeps calling and asking questions and stuff like that. And I just keep answering. After that, she wouldn't hire somebody else. I didn't hear from her anymore. It's business. It's not personal. I don't take it personal. It is what it is. Probably a few months later, I get a call from her. A few weeks, maybe a few months later, she says, I, I, I just wanted to talk to you about a problem that I'm having. And I said, what's that? She said, the lady that I hired to, 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 to write my book, to ghostwrite for me, she says she writes on a third grade level, third grade education. And I said, let me ask you a question. Did you go look at her books before? Like in the books that she's written? Uh, I said, as a ghostwriter, you know, I'm not talking about the books she's written, you know, helping other people. I said, did you go look at the books that she read? Has she written any books under her own name? She was like, yeah. I said, did you buy any of those books? She was like, no. I said, that's your fault. I said, you hired her. She did what you asked her to do. She, You asked her to write a book for you. She wrote a book for you. But she can't write a book outside of her understanding. I said, so that's why her price was so low. I went at me. I said, but, and she, she started asking me, she said, um, you know, I asked her to redo it and she, she redid and it, it sounds even worse than before. I said, yeah, she, you're, you're literally dealing with her level and that, and that doesn't make her bad. It doesn't make that. It doesn't mean like, you're not a victim here. I said, you're, you're dealing with her level. That's her level of education, her level of knowledge, her level of revelation. You're dealing with her level. She can't go beyond that brass, whatever's over her head, that heaven. She can't go beyond that. Legally, she can't go beyond that. She just stuck right there. 
or what have you. I said, your job was to go and look at her books, go look at her stuff. And then you can see, you know, what level that she works on, what level she writes on or what have you. And she said, yeah. So she tried to keep me on the phone for a long time. I'm just sitting there, just counseling her. And she said, and I started getting off the phone because I felt like I could tell that she was looking to get me to write the book. And I, I said, well, that's all I can offer you. She says, wait, 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 let me ask you this. She said, because I can't work with her. I can't, I can't work with that book that she wrote. I, I, I can't, I can't use that. You know, it, it made me sound stupid. She said, would you, could I hire you? You know, I want to work with you. I, I've read some of your books and your, your books are excellent. I want to work with you, but can I work with you at a discounted rate? Because I already gave her, uh, you know, all of my money. Basically, I think she paid this woman what she, what she was going to pay me or more. I don't know. But she's already gave her a lot of money. So can I get a discount from you? I said, no, ma'am. If she worked for my organization, then yes. You know, because then we can sit back and we, we can talk about that. But you don't get, get you don't get discounts for being cheap. You don't get discounts because you 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 already wasted my time on the phone. She never hired me. But that, that was the thing. Don't remember why I was giving that, but she never hired me or what have you. But she just kept trying to call me on the phone. And so I told her, ma'am, when you're ready to place an order, place an order. But I can't keep taking your phone calls. I can't keep taking your phone calls because at this point, we just wasting time. Sexually transmitted demons will always use the spirits of lust and idolatry as their stomachs. This way they can cause the human to lust after and crave specific people or to just crave all manners of people so that the demons, nation, the demonic nation can strengthen itself. All right, number 16. 16. The devil will never allow you to personally and single-handedly possess a nation that is in his economy. So your relationship will involve other people. I'm going to make it make sense. A lot of stuff I may say may not make sense when I first read it, but you know I'm going to make it make sense. The devil will never allow you. So if you go out there and you get somebody who is in, the, in Satan's economy, you go out there and you get somebody that the enemy has the deed to, the title to, the enemy has a right to, he will not let you keep that person. The devil will never allow you to personally and single-handedly possess a nation, a person as a nation, to possess a nation that is in his economy. So your relationship will involve all the people. They're going to cheat or they're going to leave or they're going to do both, right? Or they're going to do something to your tail to get rid of you. Either way it go, because they are part of his economy, Satan will never let you keep them. Right. He will never let you keep them. So if you go out there and you get yourself a demonized man, he may, he can have his time where Satan will let you have visitations with the man, the human, the person. And this is what I find. You can fall in love with the person, the human. But then the person is in the enemy's economy. And so the enemy has his times where he brings the person under subjection. Right. And so now the person is under the influence. He's under the influence of thoughts that he had warfare all day long. I told you guys, um, according to uh, science or according to the world of psychology, we have. 60 to 70,000 thoughts a day, 80% are negative, 90% are repetitive. That's how much spiritual warfare you go through on any given day. And so when the enemy wants a man or wants a woman to bring you into captivity, he will allow you to meet the person. He will allow you to meet the person. And with that, he allows you to see the person's potential because we have, an, we have a tendency when we see potential, we get excited because we're creative, right? We have a creator. We are creatures because we were created by him and therefore we are creative. We were made in his image, so we are made in his likeness. Uh, we are creative because we come from a creative God. We come from the creator himself. The enemy understands this. And so one of the problems that we have a tendency to have is that we're trying to fix things. We're trying to fix people. And we see things in people and we see their graces and we see their gifts and we see their talents and we see their potential. And when we see all that, we think, oh, I could do a lot with this. If this person just lets me... I this man here, I if I could do a lot with him if he let me. Oh, what happened? And so the enemy will let you have a visitation. You get to meet the person. But then as soon as, soon as you give in to the influence of the enemy, you give in to the desire, the temptation, the lust. You give in to something that's ungodly. Once the enemy has you, then the enemy then brings that man under his influence or brings that woman, woman under his influence. Which means now the person talking to you crazy. Now the person may have a change of heart towards you because they're being inundated with negative thoughts about you. 
They're being inundated with negative thoughts about you. Um, and then from there, the enemy can drive them out of your life or drive you out of their life because the enemy, now he has you, he's already got you. Um, it's very single, similar. And I think the perfect example of this, if you don't are not aware of it, is a story of Amnon and Tamar. Amnon started having a demonic, lustful desire for his sister Tamar, right? He sees his, his sister, half sister, but she's still a sister. They had the same dad, different mom. But he sees her and he, he just starts all of a sudden being inundated with these lustful thoughts. Can't stop thinking about her. Can't stop thinking about the curves. Can't stop thinking about the way she look and the way she bite her lip. I just can't stop thinking. He, it's, just, it's just on his mind it, it, and it's tormenting him. Or what have you. He's probably in the bed at like night playing with himself. He's probably in bed doing stuff that he ain't supposed to do. But I'm saying he's being inundated to the point where now he starts feeling like he just want to lay there in the bed. His friend comes up to him and talks to him and says, hey, dude, what's going on with you? What's wrong with you? And he said, man, I want my sister Tamar. I don't know what it is. I really want that girl. And he told him, he said, listen, play like you sick. And then tell your dad to send her into your room to feed you cakes that she made with her own hands. And then when she get in there, put everybody out of the room. And you got it. You, you hit that, right? Or you basically take it. And that's what Amnon does. He plays sick. Um, his, he says he would personally request for Tamar to come into the room. Tamar comes in there. He puts and he has her sitting on his bed, feeding her, feeding him. And then he puts everybody out of the room. And then he says, come and lie with me. So he tried to get her in his will. She was not willing, right? She says, no, don't do this wicked thing. This will bring shame upon our family. This will bring shame upon us. Such a wicked thing should not be done in Israel. And then he forced her. He ends up taking authority over her and forcing her because she was weaker. Weaker. Well, what ends up happening after that, the Bible says after he was done, he hated her even more than he loved her. That's how demons are. It's a demonic desire. He had a demonic appetite. Sometimes a demon can be looking at you like, oh, I want that person. And you, that person comes into your life, right? And you know, the, the, this, this dude or this woman, they love all the crap out of you. And it seems like they really want you more than life itself. And then all of a sudden, when they get to you, they, if they get you into sin, they get you into outside the will of God, then they start to despise you. They start to pull away from you because the objective, the, the reason they were attracted to you is they were demonically, their spirits were attracted to you. Their spirits were attracted to your potential or they were attracted to some demons that were in you. They were attracted to your potential or they were attracted to the demons that were in you. And so consequently, once Tamar, once Amnon was finished, he basically told his, wife, his sister, get out of this room. I want you in here. And she said, this, this thing you're doing to me right now, this is even worse than you raping me. In other words, now I can't wear, and as a king's daughter, I'm on a platform for people to see me. Now I can't wear the garment of a virgin anymore. And everybody know they didn't come to no wedding. They know I ain't married. So I got to wear the in-between clothes, which means I got to wear the clothes of a harlot. I'm about to deal with not only the rape, but the shame. And the people that don't care, they, don't, they ain't going to be trying to hear that I was raped. They ain't going to be trying to hear that. She ripped her garment to grieve, but also because it was illegal for her to wear that garment. She was no longer a virgin. Once he did what he did to her, she was no longer a virgin. And that's how her brother Amna, um, Absalom was able to look at her and say, did your brother lie with you? And she said, yes. He said, go in the room, go in there and chill. Go up in there. Go up in there and chill. Basically, come out of public sight so that you'll have to deal with the, 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 the anger and the rage and the backlash of society of Christian, of, of, of religious people, come come out of, come on out of plain sight, or what have you, come somewhere where I can protect you. I mean, even if it's the thing where she said, you've done worse, because in that, she expected at least go ask for dad, for dad's hand for him to marry me. That way you can take away my shame that you just gave me, because the shame going to mainly find up, fall upon me, because you get to wear what you want to wear. You get to wear what you want to wear, so the shame is going to fall upon me. So, it would have been better in her mind. Hey, go talk to dad and say, hey, I want to marry her. I violated her or what have you. Let's get this on the road so that she can wear the garments of a wife. But when he violated her, he robbed her of so many things. If you know Jewish culture or Jewish tradition at that time, when he violated her, which we never heard about get, getting pregnant, she could not marry because she was considered by Jewish tradition a harlot. Uh, she could not marry because she wasn't, she didn't cry out rape and, you know, or he wasn't persecuted for the rape. So she was looked upon in a shameful way. Nobody would want to trade their sons, you know, have their sons marry her, which also bound her to a life of childlessness. It, it, it made it where she could never marry somebody and then she would be bound to a life of childlessness. I suspect that 
that amongst other issues is the reason Absalom decided to take out Amnon. It's because through taking out Amnon, he could free his sister's hand. Right. Through taking out Amnon, and now he continued because he got bitter toward his father, what have you. Uh, but through taking out Amnon, he could free his sister. Uh, he could free his sister from that curse so that she could marry, she could have children, or what have you. Let me see here. The, de the devil will never allow you to personally and single-handedly possess a nation that is a person that is in his economy. So your relationship will involve other people. They're going to keep leaving you. They're going to keep cheating on you. Oh, what happened? Number 19. Number 18. Number 17. See how it is? I went down all the way. Okay, number 17. An ungodly or illegal soul tie is a bridge between two souls. Remember I said I already mentioned that? So I'm going to leave that alone. An ungodly or an illegal soul ties a bridge between two souls. I mean, it allows the enemy to cross over from one soul to the other. I will say this. Um, demons are not omnipresent, meaning they can't be in all places at one time. So if your uncle Earl got a, a Jezebel spirit and he got a girlfriend named Tammy, uh, his Jezebel spirit can't possess him and Tammy at the same time. It can rule over them through Uncle Earl or what have you. But it can't possess both of them at the same time. But let's say that that spirit in him is interested in Tammy. I'm making those set the stage for Ahab to enter Tammy, or it can go between him and Tammy. It can go between him and Tammy because so Uncle Earl would be the demon's house. Tammy would be his hotel. So it would live in Uncle Earl. That's his primary source. But then it can go over and it can be it can be in Tammy too. Oh, what have you? So you will see times where Uncle Earl seems to be normal. His humanity is at the front. He just seems to be, you know, good. But Auntie Tammy out there acting crazy. She out there breaking his stuff up in the yard. She just acting out, what have you. And then after that, once she's done, she's had her rage fit. That spirit can then go back out of her and go back into, so demons can travel and get back into Uncle Earl. Now Uncle Earl is flabbergasted he oh i can't believe it in that moment she realizes oh i think i just messed up what i don't know what possessed me it was we get that statement i don't know what possessed me and so from that point on that um uh, uncle earl may pick her up by the throat <laughs> or what have you y'all over there trying to break them two apart but it is to say demons can travel between souls so one person will be a house the other person will be a hotel this is why the ministry deliverance while it's effective Sometimes you can cast out something or you can bind something that belongs to something somebody else. Or if I say to you, I'm going to do a deliverance with you, right? And you got Uncle Earl's demon is in you for a visit. It can go leave you and go back to Uncle Earl. And so basically, because it's not omnipresent, it can go back to his house from whence it came and it can chill there. And then it'll say, I'll come back to you once you've been free. And I'll try to bring seven spirits more wicked than, than myself. I'll come back to you if you still have that door open. I'll come back to you. If you haven't filled that space up that I was inhabiting, which is called a void, I'll come back to you. All right. Or if your demons get cast out, they're going to bring seven spirits. But the point is, um, demons are not omnipresent. Number 18, a yoke is an agreement or covenant between two souls. We talked about the, so it's an agreement or a covenant between two souls. This is when we start getting into stuff like legalities or what have you. So you have the um, agreement, you, you have the soul tie, but then you can have a yoke. You can have a yoke. And a yoke is typically established whenever you start making promises to a person. A yoke is established whenever you start doing things like getting into witchcraft. You can establish a yoke. A yoke is a hard thing. It's not that easy. So sometimes people are trying to get out of soul ties. And it's not the, pro the problem is not a soul tie. Soul tie, once it's hardened, it becomes a yoke. Once it's hardened, becoming a yoke. This is when Leviathan gets involved, especially when you start getting into co contracts and covenants. You're making promises to this person, or you marry the person, um, or what have you. Or you marry. You can marry a person through an event called buying a house when you're not married to them. You're entering into an agreement now. So you now have a a a a a a, a covenant. You now uh, not necessarily a covenant, but you now have a um, contract with the person, or what have you. So it makes it a lot harder to get away from the person, not just uh, physically, not just um, financially but mentally morally because it's hard for you to get away from a person that you have um it's hard for you to get away from a person that you have made plans with especially once you start investing in those plans it is hard to get away from a person like that but a yoke is an agreement a covenant between two souls number 19 to break or disrupt a, go a godly covenant demons use unsevered and intact ungodly covenants created through illegal past or current activities he then will torment you 
out of the relationship. We talked on that, so I'm not going to stay here really long. Uh, let me make it make sense. I'm going to read it one more time. To break or disrupt a godly covenant. Demons use unsevered and intact godly covenants created through illegal past or current activities. He would then torment you out of the relationship. I told you guys about this guy from my past that reached out to me in 2015. And um, he told me that he was going through a divorce. And and I'm just like, oh, no. I, I, I started telling him, oh, I'll do, I don't talk to married men. I don't, I don't play those type of games. And he was like, no, my divorce. I said, no, sir. Marry, you know, I don't play those type of games. Uh, but he told me that, and I used to date him when I was 18. And he told me, he said, the 20 years he was married, he said, I couldn't stop thinking about you. He said, I used to lie next to her. And I'm thinking to myself, I hope you don't think that's flattering. Because it's not. But he was like, I, I was lying next to her and I would just think about you. And um, by the end of that conversation, I said, I release you from that witchcraft. I release you from that covenant in the name of Jesus. And he was like, what? I said, I set you free. Because I realized back in the day when I was in the world, I used to seduce that man. I used to seduce that man. I used to light candles and and, and dance in front of him. I would do stuff to me. I would intentionally mess with his mind. I would intentionally mess with his mind. Consequently, he found himself in a a soul tie and because he didn't get out fast enough when the window the way of escape the window was open he didn't get that soul tie hard and it became a cup it became a, a yoke and so that yoke was on that man's neck even though i got free he wasn't free even though i got free he wasn't free consequently you know he set up that he was like being tormented in his mind now i know a lot of it could have been lies and what have you but realistically speaking if you're lying next to your wife thinking about somebody else or you're lying next to your husband thinking about somebody else, that's torment. And if you do it willfully, then your heart is wicked. Your heart is wicked. And it's a soul tie that you haven't addressed or what have you. But a yoke is an agreement, a covenant between two souls or to break a God or disrupt a godly covenant. Demons use unsevered or an intact soul ties. A lot of marriages are destroyed because one or both parties that came into the marriage still has soul ties and sometimes even um yokes attached to other people where they can't stop thinking about another person i saw a lady they used to post to facebook pictures of lingerie she was going to wear for her husband at night and um i was kind of still a babe in christ at the time but i remember seeing it and i remember you know just calling it out i was like y'all let me tell you i was like dudes let me tell you why your woman pays posting lingerie because she would take it out she lay it on the bed with the shoes going to lay this out for my husband tonight. Then she'll post up pictures of food uh, that she's cooking and stuff like that. And I recognized the issue. I said, that's an unsevered soul tie that she has with somebody else, probably a yoke that she has with somebody else that left her. And I think she had kids with somebody else, but somebody that left her. And that person is either still on her page or was still on her page or his family members are still on her page or friends were still on her page or she had the page open in her imagination. He was going to come and look at the page and he was going to regret losing her. He was going to regret losing her. He was going to look and say, dang, she's doing it for her husband all this time. And she still looks fine. And she's wearing all this lingerie. Or whatever. She, she was doing that in an attempt to show the world, this is what he gets over here. This is what I do over here. But you can see clearly out of all the lingerie and the good food and the beauty that she had, the one thing that she was lacking was respect for her husband. Thank you. The one thing she was lacking is what God, what God told her to have. Wives respect your husband. She was lacking respect for her husband. Because she didn't have respect for him, she put that stuff out on the internet and she posted up pictures and stuff like that that were just seductive. But the, the objective of that spirit, you know, because I, she's talking to somebody from her past. At the same time, that spirit in her was causing men to lust after her. Was causing men to lust after her. Or what have you, so they can use her to bring men into captivity. And I can't tell you for one, for every one woman that comes on the internet naked, how many men get taken into captivity by that one woman just through, the, just through them not being able to stop looking at her photos and following her page and, and liking her statuses. How many men get, end up getting caught up and taken into captivity and then they get married and they're still in captivity. They're still in the enemy's economy. And because of that, when they get married, the enemy don't like legal stuff. So while they were unmarried, they had ugly, illegal, ungodly desires for their wives. And, you know, the women they end up marrying, they probably ended up hitting them while they were unmarried. Then they turned around and got married to the person. While they were unmarried, the devil caused them or allowed them to be hugely aroused because they were unmarried. But once you get married, that thing becomes legal and Satan don't like legal things. Demons don't like legal things. And so now once he gets married, he gets bored. 
he is bored. He's just looking around like, it's just a regular way. You know, she just want to do standard or what have you. He starts thinking about or those demons start messing with his mind, inundating or torment his mind, making him thinking about making him think about uh honey drop. Start making him think about honey drop and how honey drop used to be such a freaking honey drop or what have you. So his demons, you know, start tormenting him out of that relationship or leading him into other relationships to have extramarital affairs, extramarital affairs, so that he could destroy his marriage because the enemy is looking to take him back into captivity. Was that a mouthful? So if the enemy wants to come against your godly covenant with a person, he will use those those soul ties and those ungodly covenants that you're still, you're still a part of. Uh, got two more for this. This is actually 21. 20 voids are like bellies with no brains. To access a void, one must first gain access to a person's heart. From there, whatever access that void can from there, whatever accesses that void can tell the soul what it is hungry for. Like I said, a lot of stuff I'm going to say is not going to make sense until I make it make sense. Voids are like bellies with no brains. To access a void. So basically, imagine being hungry but not knowing what you're hungry for. Just hungry. At that point, you'll probably eat anything, right? You don't, you don't care. You're just hungry. Uh, but... A void, I told you guys before, is a black hole in the soul. And you are a multidimensional, multifaceted creature. So that means that you have your, your platonic room. You have your father room, which is under your parental room. You got your mother room. You got your daughter room or your, your son room. You have your financial room. You have your professional uh, uh, realm. You have your um, social realm. You have all these different realms, you all these different dimensions, all these different sides of you, right? You have all these different sides of you. Well, every side of you may not be illuminated. We talked about that before. Do you have a dark face? A dark face is a void. That means, let's say, if I turn you over to the social side, I turn you around to the social side, and it's just a blank face. That means that you're socially awkward. You don't know what to do in society. You say the wrong things. Um, you do the wrong things because you haven't really gotten out there and gotten to know people or, 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 because you keep surrounding yourself with the same type of people. So you end up being relational, re relationally retarded. So in that particular room, there's darkness. I mean, there's a void. And wherever there's darkness, there will be demons because demons live in darkness. They have dominion over dark darkness. That's their time. That's their space. And so what the enemy does, you can find, you can come in contact with somebody. And we'll call this guy, we're going to go with Jason again. You got Jason over there. And, um... Jason platonically, the plus the plot the platonic dimension, the filial dimension of him, amazing. Jason makes an amazing friend. I'm talking about you friends with Jason. Let's say you're a female. Jason is an amazing friend. But Eros, romantically, Jason is broke. In the area of philia. There's light. He's invited God in that area. So all of his friendships are thriving. All of his friendships last. They live. They last a long time. You happen to be his female friend. But in the area of romance, he's been broken because of his parents, because your uh, mother room, your mother room, your, your, your mother room, your dad room, they neighbor the romantic room. And so there's darkness over here. Remember, demons are always looking to take, take over territory. So the demons in the darkness over here are going to start to mess with the territory over there. So now you may find yourself attracted to a zani. You, you find yourself attracted to a man uh, who reminds you of your dad. So he comes in through the door that is reserved for your husband. He comes in. He comes in. He's full of demons, right? But he's sucked in. He's being pulled into the area where your dad is absent. Or what have you, but he comes in, so he has access to that particular dimension, and then the enemy will use him to open you up for other spirits to come into that dimension. So that area that's dark, there's a throne in each area, and on that throne, if God's not there, it's going to be dark. If God is there, it's going to be illuminated. That means there's going to be revelation there, there's going to be light there, right? God's going to give you revelation, he's going to give you wisdom, he's going to give you understanding, he's going to give you knowledge, he's going to give you what you need to uh to, to be good. So every time I turn you around. I'll see these like faces. I'll see you are illuminated. And if I say something, you'll be like, girl, and then you'll give me revelation.
But then I must, if I turn around, if I'm, if I'm, if you're dating Jason, for example, and you, you're friends with him first, y'all best friend, man, this man was my best friend. This man was, we so cool. And he never got healed romantically. And let's say I was dating him and I turned him around. He says, Hey Tiff, what are we doing? I, you know, we got this friendship and I, I really want to get to know you better. You know, I want to get to know you on another level. You know, I want to, I want to pursue you. I want to pursue you romantically. I want to build something with you or oh, what have you. I, I, to be honest with you, I'm serious about this. You know, I'm not coming to play. I'm coming for marriage or what have you. And so I would love to get to know you there. And slowly but surely now, I'm still going to be, we're still going to be talking friendship stuff because there's some things that we can't do when we're not married, right? But slowly but surely, he touched my hand or he does something. He's, I'm turning him around romantically, Eros. As I started to turn him around, I started to know he, he's a horrible boyfriend. He's a horrible boyfriend, but we're still friends. We don't live together. We ain't doing nothing or what have you. I turn around, mess, mess around and marry that joker. When I turn around, if I marry him, now I'm out there talking about some. He a narcissist. And people wonder how I got sucked in. I met his human side, or I met the illuminated side of him. I met the side of him that was flourishing. I met the side of him. He makes an amazing friend. He's an amazing friend. So that's why it's so easy for him to cheat, because he makes an amazing friend, because he can go and he can bring women in through being friends with them or what have you. And through their friendship, the women are like, I ain't nothing wrong with him. I think he's a good man. I think he's an amazing man, but they haven't seen the side of him that I am married to. They haven't seen the side of him that I get to see. You know, they haven't seen that side of him. Oh, what have you? But that's what demons live. They live in voids. If you want to know where a demon lives, it lives inside of a void. A place, a void is a place that's void or absent of light or absent of God. It's absent of God. So voids are like bellies with no brains. To access a void, this is why the Bible says, guard your heart for out of importance the issues of life. To access a void, one must first gain access to a person's heart. It's got to bind you, which is the strong man of your nation. And then it can spoil your house. From there, whatever access that void can't, uh, what, from what from there, whatever, whoever access, accesses that void can tell the soul what it is hungry for. So if a demonic spirit gets into that darkness, gets into that void, it can tell you, you want marriage. So now all of a sudden you start getting thirsty for marriage. You start being thirsty for a relationship or uh, what have you. you. You find yourself, I don't know why, I seem to be content, but you have voids. You never let God came into that room. And after a while, demons moved into that space. And when they moved into that space, rather than you just saying, I don't know what I feel like I need. Now you're saying, I need a man. Or I need a woman. I need this. So those demons are telling you what they want. I, I'm, the demons are saying, hey, listen, we need to see souls being captured by you. Bringing souls into captivity through sex and illicit conversations. We need that. Oh, what happened? So let's move on. Number 21, which is the last one from this list. Demons can cause a man or woman to be aroused. I've talked about this on the last video. This happens when one person's demons are attracted to another person's uh, strength or their demons. Demons can cause a man or a woman to be aroused, just like they can actually affect you in the bedroom when you get married. You can find yourself super aroused while you're single and doing stuff you ain't supposed to be doing and turn around and get married. And all of a sudden, you, you, can't, you can't get it up for your wife or a woman you sit up there and you don't want him to touch you or what have you. And that's because your appetite was demonic. It's not just fleshly. Of course, we have a natural appetite and it's not necessarily, it's not illegal. Like, for example, an ungodly appetite is like, I can wake up feeling like, dang, I'm looking forward to getting married, right? Um but I don't give you, I don't give into the temptation or do I meditate on it? Right. So I, I can just sit up there and say, oh, let me get out this bed. Let me pray. Let me do this. Let me do that. What have you? I'm going to ignore it. I'm not going to give any, I'm not going to give any energy or effort to it. I'm not going to give anything to that thing. But um, demons can cause a man or woman to be aroused. And so if I gave energy to that thing, if I sat back and I was feeding it, right, and it would grow, that would cause it to grow. If I was feeding it by meditating on it, if I was feeding it by touching myself or buying a toy from a store, if I was feeding it by doing something dumb, then that thing can start to consume me. It, because I'm feeding it slowly but surely, it will start to get bigger than me. And then it becomes overwhelming to the part where it's now Jezebel in me. Now it's controlling me. Now it's bullying me. It's telling me what I will do and what I won't do for that day. Uh, but once I'm married, I want y'all to hear this. 
Once I'm married, that spirit can sit back and lift. The spirit of lust and perversion that had me sitting up there back when I was unsaved that said, mm, don't you want some more? Don't you want some more? Don't you want some more? Get married, that thing can fly. It can say, I'm out. I'm going to fall back. I'm going to fall back because what she's doing now is legal. I'm going to fall back. And so I can go from being outside of the marriage if I was silly, if I was doing it, from being a freak to being a nun inside the marriage. Get inside the marriage and all of a sudden it's like, I don't do that. I don't want to do that. I, I don't do that. I don't want to do that. That's why you have so many people that, that, that this reputation for marriage nowadays when people say that um, once you get married, the sex seems to dwindle. The reason it starts to dwindle is because the enemy gets you to take from tomorrow and give everything from tomorrow into today for the wrong person. And what that means is that the enemy wants you to not only sexually attract, uh, attach yourself, uh, morally attach yourself, spiritually attach yourself, physically attach yourself, to another human being. The enemy also wants to rob you of the pureness of, of, of intimacy. And that way you reduce intimacy to nothing but sex. He wants you to, he wants to rob your idea, your mind, change the way you see intimacy. So it becomes nothing but you trying to get your rocks off, as they say, or you just trying to, and so what ends up happening is the human was made for intimacy. We were made for intimacy with God through worship, and through obedience, submission, uh, but we were for our spouses. We were also created to have intimacy with them. Well, what the enemy does is he gets you when you're not married to do all of the stuff that you're supposed to do in marriage, and he changes your mind about that. And so now it's no longer intimate. So when you go when you get married, your your spouse doesn't get those intimate encounters because there's ministry and intimacy. But your spouse doesn't get those intimate encounters. Instead, they get a person that's horny. Does that make sense? Please tell me if it makes sense. They get a person that just wants to use their body to get off. That's it. They get a person that's just sitting up there and, and, and the guy's like, switch position. Do this. Do that. Do this. Do that. Because he never got free and because he's bound by what the, he, he gave all of himself yesterday to those broken women to the point where today he doesn't have nothing left for his wife. And so his wife got to work hard. She got to do a lot of stuff to try to get him to be aroused. And what he'll find is that maybe he's not too aroused by his wife. And when he go out to the other women, he's aroused. Because again, demons don't like legal things. They don't like legal things. Let's talk about how to rid yourself of SCDs or sexually transmitted demons. How do you get rid of them? I'm going to speed walk through all of these because most of this stuff is stuff we, you know, give advice we give. During every how to overcome depression, how to overcome sadness, how to overcome this, or what have you. So it's probably one of those lists, but it's still going to be good. Number one, repent. Don't just repent for yourself. Repent for your parents, your grandparents, and your ancestors because it's in your bloodline. So if it's in your bloodline, that means it's iniquity and you are prone to do it. Repent so that you can dislodge it. Okay. So repent. I repent for the sins of my parents, my grandparents, my ancestors, and myself. Lord, set me free from lust, perversion, a lasciviousness, and Every act of, of, of pornea, I, rep I renounce it. Now I come out of agreement with it in Jesus' name. Set me free from it, God. I, I present my body as a living sacrifice to you, holy and acceptable, um, which is my reasonable service. I thank you for the body. I thank you for good health. And I'm committing, God, that I won't uh, use my body for illegal activity, but I will uh, present my body to my spouse when I'm married. This is my commitment to you in Jesus' name. But you repent. And a lot of times what you start doing is you let God know this is my promise to you. This is my promise to you. Number two, uh, Romans 12, 1. Present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. That's Romans 12, 1. But also, number two, rededicate your body to God. Take it out of Satan's economy because if it's Satan's economy, he can give you sickness. If it's in Satan's economy, he can cause you to have all these, all these illicit, uh, very strong sexual desires that you can't seem to get rid of them. Get rid of and so your body is part of your economy, uh, part of the economy. So what you have to do is take your body out of Satan's economy and put it in the kingdom's economy. You do that through rededicating yourself 
to God, not only just spiritually and mentally, but also physically. This is what I will do with my body. And this is what I will not do with my body. Remember, I talked about this the other day. Um, Satan sees people as outfits. Your body is nothing but an outfit for him. That's it. You are part of his wardrobe. So if you're in his closet and he know that I'm thinking Broderick. I don't know where that name come from. And hopefully nobody has that name over here. But Broderick has a problem. He likes light complexion women with long dark hair and Asian eyes. Albany, Albany shaped eyes. That, that's Broderick's thing. But he also wants them to have a, a big butt, a small waistline. That is his thing. That's his thing. Or oh, what have you. If the enemy, let's just say that, uh, <laughs> that's your son, father's name. The enemy wants to take, let's say Broderick is incredibly anointed. He just don't know it because he's he's still a baby in Christ. He's incredibly anointed, incredibly. And the enemy knows that the enemy knows he has a major call in his life. He's going to go do some amazing things if he stays the course. But the enemy also knows that he has an ungodly appetite. You know, it's not about the physical features. It has everything to do with him not putting a, the person's character before he looks at the skin, the, you know. And so the enemy says Broderick is not fully surrendered. So the enemy is going to look in his closet for a female that fits that description. He's going to cause him to cross courses with a female. And this is why we can look at Broderick and say, oh, he got a type because she looks just like his ex. And then it looks, the ex looks just like the other ex. And they look like the other ex or what have you. But rededicate your body to God. Rededicate your body to God. Take it out of Satan's, Satan's economy. And that way Satan can't use you to bring anybody else into captivity and you won't be in the captivity or the treasury of the enemy. Number three, fill your voids with the light of God's word and you put in parentheses Bible study. That I created that name. No, I've seen it before several times. I haven't seen it a thousand times, but I've seen it. I've seen it. Fill your voids with the light of God's word. That means study your Bible. That's Bible study. Study your Bible consistently, daily, you should not have a day go by that you're not reading your Bible. Study your Bible. So feel your voice because your voice need revelation. They need information. Every time I talk to you and I give you revelation or your pastor talks to you, anybody give you a revelation, it could be your kid, it could be your friend, it could be you. Anytime God sends revelation through a person, right? Anytime God sends revelation through a person, even if it's your pet, your, your dog, your goldfish, what have you, anytime God sends revelation, that revelation goes into a certain room and it will give you a certain amount of illuminance. Uh, so you can, it can still be uh, kind of dark in that room, but there's the, it, you can still have that low light up in there because your kid says something that made you say, whoa, wow. So your kid can come up. Let's say you're empty in the father room because your father wasn't there. So now you got rejection in that room. And so now the spirit of rejection is inhabiting that room. A lot of different spirits are inhabiting that room or what have you. You have a kid and your kid's father has followed in the curse and he walked away. He, he, he left you as well. So now you're raising a son and your son says something to you and says, mom, it's because you don't have a father that I don't have a father. You never repented. And you go, I was listening to Tiffany and she said, you know, a void is a black hole in the soul and it has a gravitational pull called attraction and it caused you to be attracted to my dad, but really you were attracted to the spirit of rejection. And you go, oh, what your kid just did was put a little bit of light in that room. Your kid just exposed the demons in that room. And typically when our demons are exposed, we say things like, whoa, woo. Ouch. We respond because in that, what we're doing is the, the furniture has moved a little bit. It hit the legs of a demon or something like that. But in that, we're starting to realize, hey, I just found an issue. When the light, when the light starts to come on, even if I cut off. I got too many lights up in here. If I cut off this light. And I cut off this light. You notice you can still see me because there's still some low light in this room, right? You notice you can still see me. Albeit you can't see me as illuminated as you can, there's still some light in this room. So when somebody gives you revelation, whether it's a kid or not, they put a little light in the room. 
And the more that kid puts light in that room, it's going to help you to see yourself and it'll help your kid and other people to see you a little bit more in that room. So you start realizing what issues you have. Your kid can start realizing what issues you have as well. And in that, um, you, you have to really kind of reestablish with the kid just because you saw mommy in, in a dark place doesn't mean you get to, you know, to, 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 to run the household or to get too familiar with your mom. You know, there's a degree of familiarity you must have, but there is respect that's needed as well. All right, let's move on. Number four, address your traumas. And you do that in therapy. I am an advocate for therapy. I am an advocate for therapy. I am a huge advocate for therapy because everything is not just spiritual, but then you can deal with strongholds, right? Those are habits and patterns. It takes 17 to 21 days to break a habit or pattern, right? And of course, that's just the basic. For some, it can take a little bit longer. Um, some they can take a little bit shorter or what have you, but you address those issues in therapy. So please get therapy. Number five, don't date until you are mature enough to discern. Don't date until you're mature enough to be discerning or to discern, healed enough to carry another soul. Because realistically speaking, that's what marriage is. You're carrying each other, right? And it's it's not an easy thing. If you can't you can't stand yourself, if you can't stand to be by yourself, if you can't stand your own uh, thoughts or what have you. Then when somebody else comes into your life, it can become tormenting to you because you're too weak. You're not you. You still, you took that one talent, which was you and buried it. And so by the time God gave you two talents, you don't know how to handle it. And so God won't give you two talents because you buried the first talent because you haven't gotten over yourself yet. When you get past yourself, then God sends you a spouse. When you get past yourself and you look, you learn how to carry yourself When you become strong, you become mature. That's when God brings somebody. Now, you can go get somebody if you want to. But that's when God gets involved. When you involve God, that's when you're mature enough to ask God to be involved. All right. Don't date until you are mature enough to discern, healed enough to carry another soul and godly enough to do things God's way. And that has everything to do with maturity. That has everything to do with holy, realizing that you're holy, realizing your authenticity and your identity. And when you get to that space, when you are godly enough, you're like, I'm not, I'm not going outside of God's will. So I, I tell you, you know, I, I've said this publicly and I'll keep saying it. I say, if again, a guy comes into my life and I've had the attempts, I'm from dudes that come into my life and they make some little sexual innuendos and stuff like that. And I realize they're trying to lead me astray. I will cut ties with them. I cut ties with them. And the reason I cut ties with them, because I know they weren't sent by God. I know they weren't sent by God. They are being led by their own lust. And whatever's leading them, if I let them in my life, if I marry them or if I sleep with them or anything like that, then whatever's leading them will lead me. And the devil is a busted booty, three feathered lie. I ain't going. <laughs> I ain't going. I ain't going. I've been absent 10 years. I ain't going. All right. And I plan to be absent until marriage. And I stay prayer for what have you. I don't trust in myself. I trust in the most high God to keep me. And the way that he keeps you is through giving you wisdom. All right, where was he? Where, where were we? Don't date until you are mature enough to discern, healed enough to dis healed enough to carry another soul, and godly enough. And you can say carry or cover another soul. You know, healed enough where you don't feel like you got to put people business on the street or what have you. You learn how to cover people, and godly enough to do things God's way. Number six, deliverance is a must. Please go through deliverance, but don't go through deliverance and then go back out into the scene because deliverance is not a shower between scenes. It is not where, you know, I can go back out here. It's not a car wash. It's not for you to go out here and go back and drive into all those little dirty neighborhoods, drive through the mud and uh, four wheel it out with your body and then turn around and say, oh, that was so much fun, girl. Oh, Lord, I don't know how many things I picked up when I was doing that. But girl, let me go ahead. Let me let me set up a session with, 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 with Tiffany Buckner. Let me go to church. Let me go to the altar. Let me set up a session with uh, Apostle Ivory Hopkins. Let me set up a session with such and such. Because, whoo, girl, I had a fun. We went to Freak Nick. Then we went to New Orleans and did some stuff. Girl, we got sloppy drunk. And then, girl, you know, me and that dude, we were, mm, 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 we were doing our thing. And so now, whoo, man, I know I need some deliverance. That's not, deliverance is not like that. Deliverance is when you have a revelation of God. When you say, I messed up and I don't want to be like this no more. It's not to say that you're going to go out there and get it together or get it perfect. It is to say you better be intentional. It is to say you better be intentional, but deliverance is a must. But just make sure when you present yourself for deliverance, you're not presenting yourself with the mindset. Well, let me just kind of wash off yesterday's sin using deliverance. And then once I'm done, I'm going to call my boyfriend and we're going to go back and we're going to hang out again. 
because then you'll pick up seven spirits more wicked than itself. And the last state of that man be worse than first, which first, which means you'll be half past crazy. And slowly but surely, okay, y'all want to do some math. I'm going to show you math. I'm going to give you some, some spiritual math, okay? Some, some natural math to help you understand spiritual things. We're going to say, we're going to say Dolly. Dolly is Christian, but Dolly got seven demons. And Dolly says, you know what? I'm tired of all this. Let me go get deliverance. When she presents herself for deliverance, Dolly should have her mind made up. I'm going to fight. Because when you because you want to fight those, those spirits, I'm going to fight. I'm going to fight that stronghold. I'm going to tear down that stronghold. I'm going to break these habits. Now, she may mess up and what have you. God gives us grace. He gives us space. But let's say Dolly don't understand deliverance. So Dolly just uses it, uses it as a car wash between that. Dolly goes and she has seven demons. Those seven are kicked out. They come back with seven more wicked than themselves than what we got. Dolly now has 49 demons. Dolly sees deliverance as a shy between sins, so Dolly goes out and she does her thing again. Now that she's even more wicked, you know, because she got spirits that have a greater rank, and now she's doing some stuff, some really dirty stuff. Here she comes and she starts being tormented in her mind. She starts going through all kinds of stuff, and she comes back and she said, please, can you take me through the deliverance? I've been having night terrors. Some tried to drag me out of my bed, <laughs> and she comes in and she goes and she gets deliverance. She's screaming and vomiting all over the place. 49 times 7, they get to come back. When they come back, Dolly now has 343 demons. Now she got 343, which means that she'll do some strange things for the change, right? Now she out there just really lo and she losing her mind. She started thinking people following her or what have you. And she, she starts going through all this stuff because Dolly didn't commit herself to a lifestyle of, of repentance. She didn't commit herself to a lifestyle of of chasing God or I start of holiness. And I'm not saying you got to be perfect. I'm not saying that you might mess, you might not mess around and fornicate. I am saying you have to be intentional. But Dolly don't do right. Dolly sits back as she comes. She goes through deliverance. 343 demons have been cast out. Now they come back seven times. How many demons does demon? Y'all want to know how legion get into a person? That's why I say demons don't mind you casting them out as long as they know they can come back. Now, Dolly has 2,401 demons. Now, one of her eyes is starting to travel to the corner, especially when she get mad. You, you ever seen people that they, they eye, when they get mad, their eyes start going over there? When you can tell when they have a demonic episode, it's like the muscle in their eye just goes, and whatever the demon says, get out, the, get out the way, eye, and it pushes over to the corner. So now, Dolly out here, she, they done put her in a, a, a mental institute. She's sitting up here, and she gets out the mental institute. She's sleeping around. She gets on drugs. She goes out there. She's sleeping around. She's uh, she's selling herself. Then Dolly comes back and she says, you know what? Somebody medicine her. I want deliverance. Dolly gets delivered from 2,401 demons. And she let them come back. Look how many demons she got now. 16,807 demons. Say time seven because she keeps showing up for deliverance. After this, 117,649 demons. But she show up again because she don't respect deliverance. After this, 823,543 demons. Mm -mm, nope. She come back again. She go to a different church because they start taking the deliverance of the old church. She come back again. She now got 5,764,801 demons. Do you see why demons don't mind getting kicked out? Because they know that they got a stronghold in Dolly. And they know that Dolly's still dealing with idolatry and she never got that void feel. And they know that they're going to get to come back. And they, she gonna keep, and they're going to keep coming back until Dolly has lost her mind. Remember I said there are sectors of the mind, right? To lose the mind means the devil took over the territory, financial realm, uh, the, the, the parental realm. Uh, um, the career realm, professional realm, the enemy starts taking over all realms of her mind. Now, D Dolly finds herself in a mental institute in a straitjacket of, of drawing on the wall with feces and telling people about space aliens and talking about a space alien keeps breaking in her house and, 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 and assaulting her. But in reality, she's seeing demons. This is why you don't play with the ministry of deliverance. It's not something that you just show up for 
and be like, I just, <laughs> and then, you know, you got a boyfriend that you gonna go home and screw. You better make a decision before you show up for deliverance. Dude, I'm now unscrewable. Okay. We not going to have sex no more. Period. Point blank. Or do you say, you know, I, 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 I'm going for deliverance. I need you to come for deliverance with me. And I need you to understand I'm not having sex with you no more. Okay. I'm not having sex with you no more. And guess what? He might leave because you submit yourself to God and resist the devil and he will flee from you. That means even demonized people will leave as well. That fear of letting people pray over you is demonic, Sister Roxanne. That's coming from the devil not wanting to be cast out. That's coming from a demon that's not wanting to be cast out. But you can set up a session with Apostle Ivory Hopkins. You can set up a session with Apostle Ivory Hopkins. Right? It just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's why the Ministry of Deliverance, a lot of times, will start refusing people. I remember the first time I was working with a lady who was in deliverance, uh, I had introduced her to a couple. She cast demons out to the husband one time. And I wasn't there for that deliverance. I was there for the second deliverance. When he needed the third time, she said, I'm not casting him back out of him. She said, he got to learn how to sustain it now. He got to learn how to sustain it because she said, I'm only making it worse for her and him by constantly doing it. Because you have a lot of people that they don't understand that once you come out of deliverance, you got to go do the work. It's not just you get up in the demons of God. No, you still got the strongholds. The strongholds not cast out. The stronghold has to be breaking, broken apart. That's the habit. You The stronghold of addiction you can go get the stronghold of the spirit of addiction cast out, but the stronghold can still be there. Meaning you have a habit of turning to cigarettes when you're frustrated. All right. Deliverance is a must. Number seven, put God first. Remember, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. You got to stop putting God last. You got to stop putting God behind your plans and your desires. And when you do that, when you put yourself before God, You'll find yourself mad at God, which is an evidence of your immaturity and your bondage because you, you've humanized you've humanized God. You bought him equal to you, bought him on your level uh, because you didn't put him first. You made yourself as high as him because you didn't put him first. When you put him first, you see him for the giant that he is, the gentle giant that he is. Uh, but at the same time, he is a God of terror. He can terrorize you, right? He can turn you over to the enemy. He can turn you over to a reprobate mind, but you have to put him first. If you do not put him first, then what's going to end up happening is whatever is first is going to be your head. So you end up being headed by demons or headed by your flesh. Your flesh is running the show. And then you wonder why you're dealing with the stuff that you're dealing with because you chase God, but you didn't chase him first. Or you went to church with the me, mind, the me mentality. You went to church, they're going to cast out my demons and they're going to prophesy to me and this and I ain't finna get no seed shoot. You gotta know what I'm going through shoot. I'm just gonna sit up here and I'm gonna sit in the congregation. But I ain't finna try to sow serve. I ain't trying to do nothing. I'm just gonna sit here because the church that's what they supposed to do for me. Not realizing that as a child of God, you are a minister of God. You're supposed to be ministering to other people. It don't mean you have to make it. That means that sometimes there's somebody in your church that just needs you to say hello. Hey beautiful, how are you today? Somebody that just needs to hug you. For you to hug on. But you, you make ministry all about you. You make Christianity all about you. And consequently, you end up just always falling behind. But address your traumas through therapy. Um, I think I'm going to skip some. I said deliverance is a must. Yeah. Address your traumas through ther therapy. Don't date until you're mature enough. So I did those. Okay. Uh, deliverance is a must. Number seven was put God first. Number eight, do not sit with fornicators or the sexually Im immoral. And I have to clarify that because some people be ready to, to, to crucify me. Jesus sat with tax collectors and sinners. They came to the table to eat. They didn't come to the table to feed him. There is a difference between pouring and being poured in two. They came to, to receive, not to give. When you go to a table to, with a person so that they can talk about, man, what you talking about? Man, that girl, man, that girl, man, I was in that girl, man. I was in that girl for like 30 minutes, man. What, man, man you, you, what were you doing up in there? Man, I feel like I got lost. And what have you? They look over there at you and you over there with your Christian self talking about something. No, I don't do that. Oh, no, no, man. He weak, man. He don't do that. <laughs> You're being influenced. You're going to be bought under the influence. So that's not a table that you sit at. Now, if I go sit at a table and somebody who struggles with fornication sits with me, that's okay. If they're sitting with me and they're, they're there under the capacity. Sister Tiffany, how did you break up with the spirit of lust, lasciviousness, promiscuity, and all the stuff that you struggle with? Because I heard you. You said you've been 10 years abstinent. I can't even imagine that. How did you do that? I'm at the table to pour. 
So I'm not under the influence of that person. I'm influencing that person. But when you go to a table and you're under the influence of something witchcraft, demonic, ungodly, that's illegal. So do not sit with fornicators, fornicators of the sexually immoral. G Tech, you're awesome. Thank you. God bless you. I can sit with a person if they say, hey, listen, can we go to lunch? I'm just so struggling. We're happy. I'm at the table to pour. But if they say, girl, we got to hang out. I'm just saying, we just got to go out sometime or what have you. And then let's say I sit, I went out because I don't know no better because I saw her in church. And I get out there and she was like, girl, these folks in church, they be just so fake. I mean, I'm just saying, you know, we, 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 like I heard you say on your video, your bodies ain't safe. Your body don't care nothing about that. Your body, because girl, I ain't gonna lie. I still be, I ain't going to the table with her no more. I'm a minister to her at that moment. She, don't, she ain't gonna come to the table with me no more by the time that conversation is over with. Because right there, right then and there, what's in her is trying to influence me. That's why God, when he talks about sitting with fornication, fornicators and don't sit in the seat of the scornful, uh, don't pour your, your um, pearls, don't give your pearls to swine. What God is saying, those things can bring you under the influence so they can attack you. You can be brought under the influence of what's being spewed at that table. A lot of people sit back and they're Christian. I, I do. I still go around my unsafe family members because that's how you shine the light of God. Well, it depends on the table. If I'm sitting at a family reunion and there are 16, <clears throat> 16 people, or 25 people, or 84 people, and they're out there talking about thotting it out and stuff like that, I ain't helping them. I ain't helping them because I can't open my mouth and talk about God without being ridiculed. I can say a few things, and nine times out of ten, they're religious, they'll say amen. If I want to help them, I set the table. I don't do one-on-one -on -one sessions anymore, so I'm sorry. But set up a session with Apostle Ivory Hopkins, if that's what you mean. Go to pilgrimsministry.org. I got to set the table. Hey, what are you doing this Tuesday? Come to lunch with me. For real? Yeah, come to lunch with me. Okay, girl, because this is a lot I want to share with you. And at that table, I'm pouring. You got to call in your life, child. I don't know why you're running. Now, the, the table switch, so she said, I don't want to talk about all that. I mean, I'm just saying, I came out because you invited me out. Now, now I'm saying, I'm going to make sure she knows what I'm inviting her out for. But I'm just, I'm just, ugh. and I'm like, okay. And she said, so can we not talk about that? Okay. Anyhow, let me give me a drink. Waiter, can you get me a margarita with some gin? And y'all forgive me, I'm not, I'm not too privy with alcohol with some tonic or whatever in there. But girl, I got to tell you about this MF. This MF came to my house last night. Now, what's happening at the tables, the tables have turned, whereas now what's in her is trying to bring me under the influence. I said, sis, I understand you not want to hear about my faith and stuff like that, but I really don't want to hear about your lifestyle. Let's talk about something else. Let's talk about what are your plans in business? What are your plans here? Girl, it's just, I, I mean, I can't talk about my life, your lifestyle, your lifestyle. Right then and there, I know me and her ain't coming back to the table again until she sits back and says, I want what's on you. That's right. Have no fellowship with the works of darkness. I want what's on you. I want, I want what's in your life or what have you. Other than that, we're not going to the table because what, what, what's, the, what's happening is the spirit is trying to bring you under the influence. But put God first. Do not sit with fornicators or the sexually immoral. Number nine. One more after this and then we're done, guys. One more after this and then we're done. done. Number nine, wise counsel is necessary. Wise counsel is necessary. This is how to rid yourself, rid yourself of sexually transmitted de demons. Wise counsel is necessary. This is your hospital. These are your nurses, your doctors. The Bible says there's safety in a multitude of counselors. Wise counsel is necessary. So you may find yourself in a company of an older man or an older woman who sit back and say, so this is what you got to do. And so whenever you find yourself feeling like that, give me a call. Whenever you find yourself feeling like that, you know, I need you to acknowledge where you are. I need you to acknowledge this particular scripture. I want you to put this by your bed. I want you to put this in your shower. You know, find some type of way to put it on your shower. I need you to acknowledge, you know, the, the word of God as it relates to your body or what have you. And I need you to remain accountable. And tell, I want you to be honest with me. If you find yourself, if you do something that you weren't supposed to do, I need you to be accountable because we may have to do something a little bit more uh a little less practical and a little bit more, you know, demonstrative or what have you. But do not sit. Do not sit 
with fornicators and the section of moral wise counsel is necessary. Last one, number 10, don't put your body or yourself in a position where it can bully, seduce, or manipulate your soul. Do not put your body. In other words, the way I remain abstinent was through prayer, me making a commitment to God to remain abstinent until marriage, but also using wisdom. Because my flesh don't care nothing about God. My, my spirit does. My soul does. My flesh don't. So, no man can come to my house. The only men that have come into this house are, are it could be relatives, uh, people here fixing stuff. If I'm having a gathering here, something ministry, and there's typically going to be men and female, that's it. No man that I'm romantically tied to, or even a dude that called me his friend. You my girl. Dap it up. No. They can't come to my house, and I ain't going to their house. Realistically speaking, the only time I would go to their house is if I had company with me, another female who was saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Spirit and had the same conviction as me. And if we coming over there and, we, and there ain't nobody there for her too, because if it's another dude over there for her, no. You have to use wisdom because the minute you find yourself in a pickle, the minute you find yourself in a situation, that's when the enemy utilizes that opportunity. Give no place or no opportunity to the devil. He utilizes that to get you aroused. He utilizes that to make that, that arousal be so strong to the fact to the point where you find you find yourself giving in uh, to temptation, but don't put your body in a position where it can bully you, it can seduce or manipulate you. Some of you make the mistake of the dude puts you a lot of pressure, or the girl says, Hey, come over here. You say, All right, you want me to come over? Yeah, yeah, come over. And then you drive your tail over there. You drive your body, the same body that God told you to flee from fornication, to use a flee. You drive your tail over there. And what you're not wanting to understand is that once you get into the physical presence of that person, that person now has access to your body. And sometimes they ain't got to touch you to arouse you. It, the atmosphere itself can be demonic because whenever people, people have demonic spirits, they set their atmosphere. Atmospheres are designed to cause things to thrive, to sustain and to, call, to allow things to thrive. And so they may have a demonic atmosphere. They may have you know, the lights then there's the, the candles and all that. You walk up in there, you wonder why it's feeling romantic up in there. You wonder why, it, it, why, why does it feel like every time I go over to this dude's house, it feels so romantic. It just feels like, I don't know. And then he's sitting up there and he's talking to him like, listen, I'm, I'm, let me show you this video. It, this video going to trip you out. <laughs> and he's sitting next to you and he on the couch and he's like, check this out. He's supposed to be your brother. He's supposed to be your friend in Christ. Right? Check this out. You know what I'm saying? And you over there laughing and stuff like that. And the next thing you know, you know, y'all talking, you're looking at videos, and you say, Man, I'm getting tired. He says, Me too. And you laid out just kind of looking at what happened. Next thing you know, he just turned over and decided trying to kiss you. And it feels good. It feels good. So for a few minutes, you, you just want to let it go. And then you start reasoning within your head why you got a tongue going down your throat. Well, it's just kissing. It's just kissing. You're, he's already lusting after you, so he's committed to the sin of adultery. And it's right. The same is true for you. It's just kissing. It's just kissing. Kissing is for play. It's just kissing. And the next thing you know, you're on that couch talking about something. Well, it's just dry humping. We ain't, we ain't really doing nothing. It's just dry humping. Now, I'm, I'm putting my hand on his chest trying to get him to stop so I can feel Christian. So I can feel like I'm doing the right thing. But it's just dry humping. And then dry humping turns to Wet humping. Now you're out here feeling something. Oh, I can't believe I did this. I can't believe. I can't believe. You're still Christian. You still love God. Your, your body don't. And you forgot that. You forgot that. You forgot that. Don't put your body in a position where it can bully you. It can seduce you. It can manipulate you into going outside of God's will. That means if I'm on the phone with God, he says, hey, I'm going to pick you up. We're going to go to the movies. I, I beg your pardon. No, you ain't. We, we go to the movies. I'm driving my own car. I don't know you like that. Over the course of time, we can establish, long, as long as we got wise counsel, some type of rapport or what have you, but we ain't going to the nine o'clock. Let's go to the seven. 
We ain't going to the nine o'clock. We going to the seven because what we're not even about to do is be out at eleven o'clock or twelve o'clock, sitting in your car talking with slow music playing. <laughs> don't think I don't know the game. Don't think I don't know the game. Next thing you know, we out there tempting and stuff like that. No, it's, don't don't put your body in that position. Don't put yourself in that position where um, you feel the need to compromise. Anywho, I love y'all. I pray that this helped you. I pray that you take something from this. I pray that you liked it. I pray that you sh shared it. I pray you hit the subscribe button. I pray that you take this and you say, Tiff, I'm going to listen to this again so that I make sure that I'm walking on the up and up and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to allow myself to pick up any more sexually transmitted disease demons. And I'm going to make sure that I get free from every unclean spirit that is in operation in my life. And I'm going to serve God and I'm going to give my body to God. I'm going to give my soul to God. I'm going to give myself to God. That's right. In the afternoon. I'm I, I'm gonna get I'm gonna give myself over to God. I pray that this lesson isn't just something for you to hear, but it's something for you to do. Don't just be hearers, but be doers. I pray that you took something from this, whether there was conviction, some type of correction, and you got revelation as to what you need to do in this next season so that God can bless you. Remember, I said this and then we're closing. It's offensive to God when he can't bless you. Because God operates in legalities, right? There are certain things that, certain seeds that invoke certain harvest. Whenever you're in the will of God, he can bless you. When you're outside the will of God, he can extend his mercy to you. He can extend his grace to you. But what God wants you to do is God wants you to be in his will so that he can bless you. And it's offensive because when you identify as a Christian and you're walking out there with rags and raggedy and looking crazy and being beat up by demons, because you refuse to get into his will, what ends up happening is um, I'm not sure what this is what this is going on. It almost feels like a distraction. So sorry, I put you in time out, dude, because you just seem like a distraction. But what what ends up happening is you when you go out to people and you're trying to minister to them. And you're trying to tell them what thus said the Lord and that you love the Lord. And they're doing better than you in the world. You become an ineffective witness. Because a witness doesn't just come to testify with their mouth. They come to testify with their life. They don't just come to testify with their mouths. They testify with their lives. You become ineffective when you're outside the will of God, getting beat down by demons, but then you're going to church, you're doing a huckabuck, you're throwing your body all over the church, you're thrashing it, you know how to shout better than the best of them, but then your lifestyle says that God is not Lord over your life because you have another Lord. And that Lord you submitted to, and that Lord has been draining you, and that Lord has been robbing you, and that Lord has got you in his economy, but yet you identify God as your Lord. And God is like, listen, don't why are you calling me Lord when you ain't even trying to serve me? You representing me wrong. You know, I'm a business owner. What would I look like if I owned a, a, a Chick-fil-A and you out here treating my customers like they put me in the Popeyes? You out here raggedy coming out there. Welcome to Chick-fil-A. What's your order, please? You know who you represent? You're fired. Because you, you're bringing a bad reputation to my business. And what you're going to do is you're going to incite those who are, who have an issue with my business because of bad encounters. So now their voices start getting louder than the people who are praising my business, which could affect me. All because you mad because somebody left you. So I'm saying that to say, we got to be better representatives of God. God wants to bless you, but you need to be within his will for him to do the things that he wants to do. Yes, he can give you things outside of his will. Um, but he blesses you and he has no sorrow to it. Um, and he wants you within his will so that he can get glory. God is glorified when you get that, uh, that house and that car, but he's more glorified when you're out here living for him. When you're out here living for him. So people can look at you and they say, dang, she got a big house, a big car, great husband, 
Well, you got a beautiful wife and they faithful to each other. And they got a beautiful marriage and beautiful children and beautiful things in their life. Because, you know, another name of God is beautiful. All right. And everything in their life is just beautiful, beautiful, just beautiful, 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 beautiful. God gets glory when you're able to testify and say, yeah, I chose God. I was abstinent. I went through being rejected because I was abstinent, because I chose God. I did all that. I went through these many years. And look at what God did. It encourages people. Then they say, I was really about to give in. My ex reached out to me. And I remember that man wanted to marry me. Tyrone it is. I remember that man wanted to marry me. And I knew he still was there. And I was so tired of waiting. I was so tired of trying to do things the right way, seeing people in church go out and do it the wrong way. Then they get married and all this. And so now I was so tired. I was about to get turned on the call back. Matter of fact, he texted me yesterday. I responded to him and we were planning on, talk, planning on talking tonight. But tonight I'm going to block his number. All because you just shared with me what it looks like to be in the will of God, to resist the temptation, to overcome the warfare and to do things God's way, to put God first. All because you demonstrated to me what a kingdom woman or a kingdom man looks like. And I see what God did for you. And I know if he did it for you, he'll do it for me. I was just about to give Tyrone a chance. I was just about to let him come over there. And I, I, I even looked at his profile on social media. You know, just trying to sit up there. Because I, I knew I wasn't liking him that much last time. I went and looked at his profile. I was like, yep, I'm still in the corner. But I was just tired. I said, you know, I think they got surgery for the eyes. I was going to try to see if I can get that eye fixed. And, you know, just, just try to get the dude fixed up so, you know, he can look presentable and stuff like that. And then I was going to put him in school so he can stop having that hung lip, that hung lip, uneducated look. You know, that look that people have and you can tell when they got no education. When you tell them, uh, I was going to get him in school so his mouth can close. I was going to get him in school so his mom, he could finally start to have something, you know, good to say to bring to the conversation or what have you. But I know that that was the enemy now. Just listen to you. I'm saying this to say God wants to use your life so that he can get the glory. You said, huh? Yeah, I don't know that look what people have sometimes when they don't have education. And when I say don't have education, I'm talking about they do dumb stuff and they live in incredible like surrounded by silliness and they just had it. No, nobody said, maybe it's just me. Maybe it's my discernment. But I used to see that even as a kid. They had that look like everywhere you go. It's a certain look I see on people. Anywho, I love y'all. I pray that this bless you. I shall talk to you soon. Bye-bye.